Good evening, Columbus community. It is Board President Adair, and I am calling our regular business meeting of the Columbus Board of Education to order on April 20th, 2021. Will you please call the roll? President Adair. Present. Ms. Beckerley. Present. Mr. Brown. Here. Mr. Cole. Present. Dr. Pierce. Present. Mr. Ragland. Here. Vice President Reyes. Here. Do you have a quorum, Madam President? Thank you so much. Um, as you can see, we have lots of students on the screen tonight, and they are going to help lead us in the pledge, and we are going to hear from them later as they give presentations about their schools. So students, I'm going to have the board members turn their mics off. You turn your mics on, and go ahead and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which is one nation under God, indivisible, with indivisible justice for all. And justice for all. Thank you. That was fun. It was like a kind of a what's, what's that called when you play the song different times. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, students. We will hear from you in a little bit. So if you want to go ahead and turn your cameras off. Okay, board members on our agenda this evening. We uh, do not have any board recognitions. We do have one public comment. There is a report from the superintendent. Uh, no report expected from our internal auditor. We have a report from our treasurer. We have two items on board matters. Um, we have our consent agenda. Then we have board announcements. We will have an executive session and we will come back to adjourn in public session. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? A motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments, additions to the agenda? Okay, seeing none, please call the roll. President Adair. Yes. Ms. Beckerley. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Cole. Yes. Dr. Pierce. Yes. Mr. Ragland. Yes. Vice President Reyes. Yes. That motion carried. Thank you so much. We will now have public comment. Okay, uh, tonight we have one speaker. Okay, here we go. We have one speaker this evening. Um, it is Dr. Vladimir Kogan. He is here to talk to us about district goals and guardrails. Action he would like is he would like the board to adopt more ambitious academic and equity goals for the district's five-year strategic plan. Uh, Mr. Kogan will have four minutes to address the board. For Lisa Nichols, do you have Mr. K Dr. Kogan? President Adair, the speaker's on the line. Thank you. Dr. Kogan, you have four minutes. You may begin. Uh, good evening, President Adair, uh, board members, and Dr. Dixon. I want to begin by commending all of you for your hard work on the district's five-year strategic plan. Uh, my worry, however, is that the goals you are being asked to adopt tonight set the bar far too low. I have three main concerns. First, the draft plan presented last week proposes a, quote, interim goal of students demonstrating at least 100% median progress toward typical growth in reading in lower elementary grades. Well, let me unpack that mouthful. 100% growth may sound good, but it simply means that students are not falling behind further. It means zero progress towards proficiency for students who start the year below grade level. And by defining the goal at the district median, it means allowing up to half of Columbus students to regularly post less than a year of achievement growth. Adopting this interim goal would mean that our district is not committed to helping students who begin their education academically behind to catch up and would allow them to remain behind. Until recently, meeting this 100% growth goal would have earned the district only a C grade on the progress section of the state report card. And I think we can certainly aim for a higher grade than a C. Second, the plan sets a third grade reading proficiency target of only 55% by June of 2026. This is the opposite of ambitious. 
Indeed, it is lower than the goal you had planned to meet by 2023 in the draft five-year strategic plan that was released three years ago. That goal was 56% proficiency. Given the district's investment in new curriculum, its newfound focus on phonics instruction, and your aggressive approach to putting nearly every student on an intensive reading improvement and monitoring plan, not to mention the nearly 300 million in extra funding you will receive under the American Rescue Plan, it's hard to understand why you would agree to lower rather than raise the five-year reading achievement target. I know that some of you are skeptical about standardized tests, but I think the evidence is clear. Students who are not proficient readers by the end of third grade will struggle to comprehend up to half of the printed curriculum in fourth grade. Three quarters will remain poor readers through high school, and they will drop out without earning a degree at rates that are four times higher. That's right, four times higher than for proficient third grade readers. Third graders in 2026 will only be starting pre-K next fall. And by adopting a 55% proficiency target, you would be sending the message that you have already written nearly half of them off. Finally, the interim guardrail 3.1 pledges to strengthen the correlation between annual district budget allocations and student needs. Since nearly 85% of the district budget is spent on teacher salaries and benefits, it is important that you clarify whether this guardrail includes instructional spending. Are we committed to equity only for the remaining 15% of the budget or for all of the resources? Teacher salaries are driven primarily by experience levels. And as I've presented to you before, there are huge inequities amongst Columbus schools in student access to experienced teachers. Unless you're willing to commit to parity in teacher experience levels between schools, the promise of aligning resources equitably will ring hollow. Um, thank you for your time and happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Kogan. Board members, do you have any clarifying questions for Dr. Kogan? Seeing none, we very much appreciate you always being an advocate and always helping us uh, look at the data. Um, and I know that you send regularly information to the board and we do appreciate your expertise in this. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Kogan, for bringing uh, these uh, ideas uh, to our attention. Okay, that concludes our public comment for the evening. I will now turn it over to the superintendent for her executive report. Thank you, board president. My apologies. Uh, tonight, I am, my mask is representing Columbus Gifted Academy. So I have a few updates for the board tonight. Uh, first, we were here from the Deputy Superintendent, Dr. John Stanford, who will share our plan to provide Columbus City School students with the COVID-19 vaccine starting next week. Next, we will hear from the student ambassadors who were with us tonight. We have representatives from Columbus Alternative High School, Columbus North International School, and Independence High School. And lastly, we will hear from Chief Engagement Officer Alicia Gillison, who will, pro who will provide an update on our efforts to get our seniors across the finish line to graduation. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Stanford to tell you more about our partnership with Nationwide Children's Hospital and Columbus Public Health to provide all students age 16 and older with the opportunity to receive the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine beginning April 26. Dr. Stanford. Thank you, Superintendent Dixon. And if I may, I'd like to share my screen at this time. I'm still getting a, a, a message post disabled participant screen sharing. There we go, thank you. Okay, again, thank you Superintendent Dixon uh, for the introduction. Good evening board. Um, uh, Madam uh, President and board members, before starting into the presentation, I would like to take just a few seconds to thank our public health commissioner, Dr. Mashika Roberts and Dr. Sarah Bodie, the medical director for Children's Care Connection, school-based health and mobile clinics program at Ch Nationwide Children's Hospital. 
both individuals and their teams have been absolutely great in making sure that we have the opportunity to provide all of our eligible students uh, a, a, a chance at getting vaccinated against this horrible virus. Both individuals and their teams have been working very, very closely with our uh, CCS team uh, to create a plan to have vaccination clinics in our schools. As you know, this vaccination program will begin in Columbus City Schools on Monday, April the 26th. Our students will receive the Pfizer vaccine, which requires two doses. Families will also have to complete the consent form in order for their child to receive the vaccine. Again, I wanna emphasize, the nurses at the clinic will not uh, administer the shot without a completed consent form on file. Tonight's presentation, as the superintendent uh, shared, will provide you an overview of our CCS plan. Uh, yesterday, we sent our first initial information and registration uh, electronically to our families with students eligible for the program. Now I'd like to start the presentation and provide the overview. At this point in time, we, we have over 8,200 students that are eligible to receive the vaccine in Columbus City Schools. Our Columbus City Schools plan is as follows. Uh, on Monday and Tuesday of the week of April the 26th, Nationwide Children's Hospital will staff uh, two of our schools on Monday and then two of our schools on Tuesday to vaccinate uh, students who are in cohort A on those two days from 7.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Nationwide Children's Hospital and Columbus Public Health are making uh, up to 750 vaccines available at each site on both days. On Thursday and Friday of that week, Columbus Public Health will staff the, the, the vaccine clinics um, on, at two sites on Thursday and two sites on Friday. Again, the same hours will apply and the number of vaccines will apply as well. And as you can see, um, with cohort A, we, would, we, we have at least 3,000 students, we have the ability to vaccinate 3,000 students with cohort A and with cohort B, another 3,000 for a total of 6,000 students having the ability to be vaccinated that week. Now, when we look at the, the schedule of schools that will house the vaccine clinic, on Monday and Thursday for cohort A um, and B, we will have Beechcroft on April the 26th and April the 29th as the, vac as the host vaccine school. Feeding into Beechcroft will be Northland High School, Afrocentric Early College, Linda McKinley STEM Academy, and Mifflin High Schools. Uh, on April the 26th, also Whetstone is identified as the host clinic school with the feeder schools being Centennial, East, Global International, and Cobbs. On Tuesday and Friday, Briggs High School is identified as the, as the host clinic school with feeder schools, Columbus Iota, Downtown High School, Fort Hayes, and West going to Briggs uh, to get vaccination. And then Independence on April the 27th and April 30th, we'll have uh, Walnut Ridge, Eastmore Academy, South High School, and Marion Franklin feeding into their schools uh, to get vaccinated on those days. Now, when we look at the sign up for this program, uh, we have uh, placed online uh, for our families the opportunity to sign up and register to have uh, their child vaccinated on a, at, a, at a time on one of those days. And so this information was, as I mentioned, sent to our families uh, yesterday. And in that electronic uh, message that was sent to them, they will have the ability to sign up for a time on their assigned day they will also have the opportunity to complete an online consent form that they don't have to print out. As soon as they complete it, it will automatically be sent to our, our team in Columbus City Schools and also the team at Nationwide uh, Children's Hospital. And again, I wanna take a second to reiterate that we must have a completed consent form on file 
in order for the student to be uh, vaccinated. We also have placed um, with that information, a fact sheet uh, for, uh, for families to look at. And we have also made all of this information available in the five major languages of Columbus City Schools so that uh, we are providing the information in the most uh, equitable uh, way possible. Now, transportation, since we have uh, feeder schools uh, that are going to be uh, partnered with uh, host clinics, we, we have to provide transportation from those feeder schools into the host clinic school. And so we will still be following the COVID mitigation protocols that we are already following, meaning that our students on the buses will have to wear their masks and that we will practice social distancing, which means that we will have about 20 students per bus um, being able to be transported. We will also have an adult escort with the bus driver on the, on the buses in order to assist uh, students. Bus pickup and returns will happen between 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning and 1 p.m. This will allow our students to be back, in, be, to be back at their, at their uh, schools in order for uh, them to be transported uh, back home that afternoon. I'm, I'm happy to say that Mr. Oldham, working with the transportation team, um, have completed all of the schedules with uh, times for uh, students to travel over to the host clinic, and uh, they are ready to go in transportation uh, for Monday. Clinic setup. When we look at the clinic setup, um, we have worked with Nationwide Children's Hospital to come up with the design that you see in front of you. And the, the clinics will be located in our school gyms at those uh, four locations, th those four schools that I mentioned earlier. With the, with the setup, we'll have a student entrance with a check-in area right when the students enter the, the gymnasium. Uh, behind the check-in area will be a, a student waiting area for students to wait in line in order to get their vaccine. In the middle of the, of the page, you see there will be vaccination stations set up for students to receive their vaccination. And then as we all know, um, students will then, after receiving the vaccination, uh, have a 15 minute waiting period for observation to make sure that uh, students have not uh, experienced any sort of uh, um, allergic reaction to the vaccine. Uh, and then once the students um, uh, have completed the 15 minute observation, they will then check out and then exit the gymnasium. And so in closing, we are proud to partner with Columbus Public Health and Nationwide Children's Hospital to give our students this opportunity to be vaccinated. As with our staff that received the vaccine a couple of months ago, this is just another layer of protection when combined with the multi-layered health and safety protocols that we already have in place for all of our schools to protect our students and staff against this horrible virus and uh, during this pandemic. So we strongly encourage our families to take advantage of this opportunity to receive a free vaccine for their children that are eligible through this program with Columbus Public Health and Nationwide uh, Children's Hospital. And so at this point, Madam President, I'm ready to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you, board members. Do you have questions for Dr. Stanford? Uh, okay, I see. Uh, Thumbs up from board member Beckerly. So I'm assuming that means no question, but good job. And a question from board member Cole. I just want to say uh, thank you so very much, not only just for the presentation, but for your yeoman's work in coordinating with uh, the city department of health and all other actors to ensure that our children in our community have frontline safety and entry back to our schools. They gradually do that. Um, this, this, this administration um, has done an awesome job, really. And in an imperfect time, we've done, we've tried to bring to perfection something that really works not only on behalf of our children and our staff, but the entire community. So I just thank you for the work that you've done without spending too much time on it. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Oh, let's go ahead. I was just gonna say real quickly, on behalf of our team in Columbus City Schools and the teams at Nationwide Children's Hospital and Columbus Public Health, thank you very much. Okay, we have Dr. Pierce and then board member Ragland. 
Um, thank you, President Adair. Dr. Stanford, thank you for this presentation and to all of our administrators as well as our partners working on this. Thank you for providing our students with this opportunity. Um, my first question is, how are we reaching our families that may not fully capture that this opportunity is available? So our families who may speak languages other than English, our families who may have um, some feelings, perceptions towards vaccines, given what we see going on with our Johnson & Johnson vaccine. What is the messaging? What is our strategy to invite those families to ensure that their students are vaccinated? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pierce, for that question. Uh, it just so happens uh, we met with our partners from Nationwide Children's Hospital and Columbus Public Health uh, this afternoon, and we, we had a discussion about uh, that hesitancy issue that, uh, that we are seeing with the vaccine. And we have already begun uh, strategizing with them on uh, a, public, uh, a public relations campaign uh, to make people aware of uh, this opportunity. But also we are utilizing the services of Dr. Klein and her team uh, to, uh, and the, the communications team uh, to send out electronic messages uh, in the form of text and, um, and, and also um, through email uh, to our parents who are eligible, who have students who are eligible for the vaccine in order to continue to get the message. Uh, also, uh, for all of those who are listening and for those um, uh, who aren't listening, make sure you, those who are listening, please uh, spread the word. Uh, we will have an information session uh, starring Dr. Dixon and I believe also Dr. Bodie from Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, with our virtual family engagement meeting this Thursday evening. And that will be an opportunity for parents to uh, check in and find out you know, more detailed information and to ask their questions um, uh, about uh, getting the vaccine uh, because Dr. Bodie will be able to dispel any myths that uh, are out there about getting the vaccine. And then lastly, with our New American uh, families, uh, we are going to uh, work with the engagement office and also with uh, Mr. Sain and the ESL team to target messaging uh, to the, the uh, New American families because we know uh, that we can't just use traditional communication uh, strategies to reach that population of students in our district. Thank you. My next question then relates to what are we, what is our strategy to ensure that the students come back for their second shot, that they don't miss that day from school? Are we incentivizing their attendance for that day once they're vaccinated? Um, do they get a, you know, some type of incentive? What are we doing to ensure we capture them for that second appointment? Uh, that's a, that, again, Dr. Pierce, thank you for the question. And that's a, a very good question. I know, um, Dr. Harris, uh, Keith Harris and, and Dr. Uh, Robert Murphy are both members of our planning team. And so they're working directly with the area superintendents and with our building principals uh, to try and, uh, and, and encourage our students uh, to participate. And so I'm not sure if they have talked about incentives uh, to get our students uh, to participate, but that's a, a good idea that I can follow up with them to see if that's a possibility. Uh, but they've already uh, started to uh, utilize the messaging that has been uh, created by our communications team uh, to utilize their communication tools that they have available uh, in, the, in the buildings uh, to communicate the message to get the vaccine as well. Um, and two more questions. Uh, the next question then relates to hydration. Um, so I hear hydration is very good prior to uh, your uh, shots. Uh, do we have plans and strategies in place to ensure that our students have bottled waters that are accessible to them throughout the day when they're getting, uh, when they're planning to get those shots? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Pierce. Uh, the short answer is yeah. I mean, we, we have been providing bottled water to all of our buildings uh, since we, we brought students back um, uh, for the, the blended model. And so there, there is already plenty of water. We can double check with building principles. Uh, to make sure that if, if, they, if they start to run low, to make sure they have adequate supplies. Uh, because we too have heard that, uh, you know, hydration helps ease some of, uh, some of uh, the, the effects of the shot that some people 
uh, may experience as a result, because not all people experience, you know, some of those those uh, those side effects. And so uh, we can certainly uh, make sure that bottled water is available. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then my last and final question, I appreciate you all for thinking about the transportation plan. Um, how have we worked with our athletic directors and coaches to ensure that our clinic transportation plan does not disrupt our athletic transportation plan? Uh, this week, I had the great pleasure to experience some miscommunication that happened related to our transportation. So I'm just simply asking, does the left hand know what the right hand is doing? Are we communicating to ensure that everything flows smoothly in terms of transportation? Uh, yeah, yes, we are definitely communicating well, but we will double down and make sure that we don't have any issues in that, in that regard. You know, one of the reasons that we, the transportation schedule right now uh, does not have any buses leaving a feeder school um, after one o'clock for that very reason, because we want to make sure that uh, students are returning back in time for them to uh, be back for any sort of after school activities that they may have, but also to make sure that they can get on their bus in order to go home uh, for the evening. And so we will, you know, again, we've got uh, a few more days before Monday. And so uh, we, we will definitely be able to double check and make sure that we don't have any problems and communicate well with each other to ensure that we don't have any problems with that. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for all your hard work on this initiative. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Are there any additional questions? Uh, sorry, yes, Board Member Raglan, you are next. <laughs> thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Dr. Stanford and your team for working with our partners on this. I just have one question. In regards to those students who uh, have gotten the vaccine prior to our effort and are getting the vaccine on their own, uh, through their own uh, ways of getting it, are we asking students to self-report, uh, or families to self-report when those students get a vaccine? I'd like for us to have as accurate of an uh, of account uh, within our buildings as possible. And uh, if students are getting the vaccine, uh, do they have the opportunity to report either to the nurses or to uh, some level of leadership within our buildings uh, that they've gotten it through other means? Thank you, Board Member Ragland, for that question. And we have had discussions about how to, to coordinate that uh, with Dr. King. Um, as a, It's a part of our normal process that parents have the ability to report vaccines you know, to the, the nurse uh, in their school building so that we have an accurate record um, of, of vaccines that their students have, um, have received. And so we, what we have talked about is having some type of messaging going out to all parents to make sure that if they have uh, obtained the vaccine from another provider, that they you know, make us aware of that so we have it on file and have it on record. And so again, the short answer is yes, we're, we're trying to put those plans in place and have that sort of uh, strategy, that communication strategy in place in order to try and make that happen. Because it's, it's for everybody's benefit if we've got that information as a part of our, our, our record as well. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Stanford. Thank you, Madam You're President. Welcome. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, back to you, uh, Madam Superintendent. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Stanford. So next, I would like to turn it over to the superintendent student ambassadors. As we started doing last month and we continue through the spring, I will be inviting our ambassadors to join us at board meetings to present about their respective schools. We have an amazing group of students representing our high school in the student ambassador program, which is specifically designed for leadership development and is an opportunity for our students to practice leadership throughout the school, district, and civic engagement and volunteerism. I would like to introduce Ms. Mia Pruitt, who serves as the, as the advisor for the Superintendent Student Ambassadors to tell you more and introduce our, our students that are speaking this evening. Ms. Pruitt. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Um, President Adair, Vice President Reyes, Dr. Dixon, Treasurer Bohoric, Internal Auditor Smith, and members of the board. It is my pleasure to once again introduce to you the Superintendent Student Ambassadors this evening. 
This evening, I present to you ambassadors from Cos Columbus North International and Independence High School. Um, they will be sharing a little bit about their personal experiences as ambassadors this year and giving you also a glimpse into their schools um, and what it's been like uh, through this past year and just sharing a little bit about that. I just really wanted to say on a personal note that I am truly encouraged um, and pleased that I get the opportunity to work with these students uh, every month. Um, they come ready, willing, actively um, engaged every month and they apply the information that they learned in real time. And so one of the, uh, as we're talking about the vaccinations and COVID, uh, the students are actually going to be participating in uh, a town hall discussion tomorrow about teens and COVID. And it, they will have an opportunity to have this conversation where information will be shared, where they can have, uh, just talk about some of those challenges and also get the information about vaccinations. We've already had some students that have been vaccinated. Some ambassadors have been vaccinated. So I'm just encouraged um, and that we know that the leadership and the information is being shared from this group. So without further ado, um, I am going to turn it over to our students from CAUSE and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It will not allow me to share my screen. Okay. Good evening. Before we start, I would like to thank President Adair, Vice President Reyes, Dr. Dixon, Treasurer Borhurik, Internal Auditor Smith and the board members of, or oh, sorry, the board members. My name is Jordan Lyons and I'm a graduating senior. Hello, my name is Michaela Anderson and I am also a senior. Hello, my name is Vida Carell and I'm a sophomore. We attend Columbus Alternative High School. We are a magnet school for college bound students around Columbus. We have the access to partake oh, sorry, who have access to partake in our AP and IB programs. We firmly believe that excellence is our standard and not the exception. The principal at cause is Daryl Sanders. Our school mascot is the president and our student to teacher ratio is a 22 to one ratio. During junior year, students will venture out and explore for internships. This allows our students to gain a first look into what it is like in the work field. Our IB and AP classes develops our students to expand their knowledge in a multitude of areas. The IB learner profile develops our students into inquirers, knowledgeable, thinkers, communicators, principal, open-minded, caring, risk takers, balanced, and reflective. Aside from our academics, we also have a wide variety of clubs and activities for students to partake in, and we also provide the opportunity to create new ones. Even though COVID has made school life difficult for everyone, CAS has not forgotten its initial goal and continues to prepare students for success. Our classes are well regulated with precaution and cleanness. Students are required to keep a safe distance from one another and disinfect their seats once class is over. Students and teachers use Google Classroom as a main source for exchanging schoolwork. We also use the app Blooms to communicate when we're not in the building. CAS staff is very supportive and understanding with students. Even during COVID, they work hard to push CAS students to their best potential. Despite being in a pandemic, our school staff have done the best they could to support seniors this year. From our lovely staff, we have gotten encouragement when it comes to our grades. We have been blessed with extended deadlines and overall, we have received an abundance of support. Our seniors have received gifts give bags of goodies from staff encouraging us to finish off the second semester strong. Sadly, this year we do not get to receive a prom, 
but we are still able to partake in our virtual events like the 2021 um, Senior Fest and the Ka Senior Breakfast. Even more exciting, we still get the opportunity to have an in-person graduation in a night of elegance. Cause has received a silver medal from US News and World Magazine report as one of the nation's top high school. The College Board has recognized our school as one of seven schools in the country for advancement of higher level math and science for minority students. Our school offers trips to Canada and Spain for students in that specific class. Our graduation rate is at 98%. We have been told by other students that what they love about cause is the diversity and the atmosphere in our building. And lastly, we are a non-judgmental and anti-bullying school. How have teachers helped you during COVID? So they become less strict with like work, like they take into consideration the what situation a student might be in. So like um, a student might not be able to finish their work online on time because they might not have internet or anything like that. So they accept like late stuff or they um, they work closely with students to take them What would you say the best thing our class has been? I really like the diversity here. Uh, I came from a place that's like, there's not many other like, different kinds of people around me. Like, and then I came here and there's lots of people with like, different races and like, it's like, it opened my mind up to a lot of things. I feel a lot more like, experience with stuff now. Thank you. Hi, Cass. Hi, Cass. Hi, Cass. Hi, What is the best thing or best event that has happened to you at cause? Um, the tech rallies that we used to have freshman and sophomore year. We obviously don't have them anymore, but probably the best part of the thing. Um, I would say the same thing. The tech rallies and stuff are fun, but you know, now we can't do it because of us having to be socially distanced. How have class teachers helped you during COVID? Well, the teachers have been like super flexible with us in our work. You know, like kind of if you need help with something, they still try the best they can to open calls and what they can do to work like together. And like it's kind of hard because we don't know anybody yet, but like they're trying to make a lot of stuff like that. Thank you. Hi, Cass. Hi, Cass. Best thing about college for me is uh, I love how the teachers are super engaged and they help me out with anything I need, whether it be assignments or things in my personal life. I just feel like they really care. So shout out to college staff. I think uh, one of the best things is uh, the workload really is going to uh, prepare you for college and go study, get far in your major, and be successful in life. I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for allowing me to share a piece of our school with you. Also, I would like to thank my teachers and staff for giving me the opportunity to participate in the Columbus City School Student Ambassador Program. This program has helped me to speak up and venture out when I see a need for change. I want to thank Ms. Pruitt and Dr. Dixon for leading this program and aiding me in finding my voice. Thank you, CCS, for preparing me for my future. I will miss you. I would like to also thank my teachers for nominating me for this program. I also would like to thank Dr. Dixon and Ms. Pruitt for initiating change and allowing student voices to be heard. I have learned to step out of my shell and use my voice to represent our young people. I've learned so much together with my fellow student ambassadors, but the thing that stuck with me the most was our session on the LGBTQ plus community with Amanda Erickson from Kaleidoscope. As a person with a background that is not really educated in terms of LGBTQ+, I learned many things such as correct pronouns and the differences between sexuality and genders. And remember, cause or excellence
is the sorry <laughs> so sorry can we do that again and remember cause or excellence is <laughs> so sorry just get it sorry about that And so Kaz, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. I just learned even more about uh, this wonderful school in our district. So thank you so much. I think that was, you guys did a great job. Um, board, do you have any questions for our Cosmic Scholars? Board, do you have any questions for Member Cole? Uh, thank you, uh, Kaz, for giving us this wonderful presentation that gave me a very clear indication that despite the adversity of the day, um, our children, our students are much, much more resilient than we often give them credit. And I'm not one of those people who fails to do that because I'm raising kids your age and I know exactly how tough you are when you are pushed to the challenge. So I applaud you on that. Um, my question to you all is, is, um, how do you want to see the transition back occur for you and your student colleagues? How can we best help guide that process for you? I would definitely just say continual connection with our students. You know, a lot of people believe that because we're young, we don't have our own feelings about certain objects and certain topics. And I feel like we can just maintain a good barrier of connection with everyone. Unless there's anyone else, I thank you so much for that. Struggle on, very <laughs> proud you. of you. Thank you so much students, that was great. Dr. Dixon or Ms. Pruitt, maybe you have the next set. Um, yes, so we will now hear from Columbus North International. Good afternoon, President Adar, Vice President Reyes, Dr. Dixon, Treasurer Barak, Internal Auditor Smith, and members of the board. Today, Tommy and I are here to represent Columbus North International Home of the Lions. Um, within the past few years, our school has changed a lot in many great ways, and we wish to share that with you today. To begin, my name is Alexa Juna. I'm a senior at Columbus North International. Um, I've been here since seventh grade, uh, and I've had the priv privilege of learning about the many countries, cultures, and languages that are represented in the school. During my sophomore year of high school, I was encouraged to take college credit plus classes at Columbus State Community College by my counselors and still take classes today. I have recently committed to The Ohio State University, and I'm a first-year ambassador. Uh, hi, my name is Tommy Pham. I am a Vietnamese American, and I am a junior at Columbus North International, and I am a first-year student ambassador. I've also been at uh, Columbus North International ever since seventh grade, which staying in Columbus North International ever since I was seventh grade has taught me that I can get used to a foreign place and be able to adapt there. Our previ previous building is where Dominion Middle School is now located, and now CNIS has merged with Columbus Global Academy and moved into their building. Although we didn't really want to accept the change, um, we were welcomed with open arms by all staff and students, and it, it's been an amazing time. Uh, while we were at the old building, we were fortunate enough to have opportunities to do school field trips. And one of the most wonderful experiences I had was an opportunity to go to Japan in the summer of 2019 with my classmates and teachers, which we went to learn more about Japanese culture by, learn by living with a host family or doing after school activities with the Japanese students. And the picture on the left is of me and my classmates with our host family. 
Moving into the new building gave us more opportunities to act with global students um, with activities that were happening at the beginning of the year and we've gotten to know more about them and their cultures and the building itself. Uh, back in 2019, we started to learn more about the new building as time passed. Then in 2020, the pandemic started and we started to do online classes for the remaining time up until now. Our transition back to the school wasn't as difficult as we thought it would be. Majority of the students follow the rules and if they don't get, if they don't, they get talked to by a teacher. A great majority of the students follow the markings on the hallway floors and on the stairs also following the rules with one person in the bathroom at a time and wearing their masks all day. Recently, a service club has been started at our school by our Spanish teacher, Ms. Kim Nack. Um, it's about providing students with the experience and opportunity to give back to their community. Recently, Ms. Kim Nack and a global teacher, Ms. Shapiro, organized a food drive this food drive was for the incoming global families who are just now getting on their feet in this country. And it's been a wonderful opportunity to see how much the both schools can do for each other. Uh, our school is a diverse place of students and teachers, where we have multiple language classes such as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Spanish, French, Arabic, and Russian, which so far the language classes I've taken is Chinese and Japanese which the opportunity of taking these languages classes can help whenever you're in college. Recently, we got a new principal, Mr. Riggs, and um, he's been wonderful with the transition and being supportive. Our teachers have also done a good job at keeping us focused on what we need to do to pass and graduate. And for me personally, our counselors have also done a great job with all the support and talking me through things that I need help with. One of our teachers, Ms. Sunderman, has an Instagram page dedicated to our students at Columbus North International. And she also posts review for exams like AP Human Geography or US History Tests. As a senior this year, I can tell you firsthand that it's not at all what I expected it to be. Um, growing up, you see all these coming of age movies talking about how senior year is one of the best years of high school and how there's so many things you can do. Um, obviously, that was not the case this year, um, but with the help of teachers and each other, we managed to make this a somewhat memorable year. Um, on our own, seniors have planned a few, out, few activities, like last December, um, we took a trip to Skate Zone 71 um, and had a lot of fun there, seeing each other for the first time in months. Um, virtually, teachers planned a winter festival um, event in which we played games, um, voted for t-shirt designs, and just had fun as a class altogether. And we've also created an Instagram page dedicated to us and our achievements this year. Also, don't forget about Senior Fest 21 tomorrow. <laughs> Becoming a student ambassador was something that gave me many opportunities from meeting new people and learning about them and their schools to meeting with Mayor Ginther and talking about how to better the city of Columbus for us and learning about our communication and personality types with Dr. Blue's cross-culture communication presentation. I would like to thank Ms. Pruitt and Dr. Dixon for the opportunity to be a part of such an amazing program. As what Alexis said, becoming a student ambassador has given me opportunities to be able to meet with people such as Mary Ginther. It has also made me get to know more about other student ambassadors from other schools. We would like to thank you for your time. And yeah, we would like to thank you for your time to hear us talk about our amazing school. Awesome, thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Alexa. We really appreciate it. Um, Board, do you have any questions for our amazing ambassadors at uh, Columbus North International? Yes, round of applause. Remember Cole? Um, she is she. <laughs> um, uh, ni hao ma, 
Well, sure, Mr. Cole. Um, I'm really excited to, I, I'm, I'm just very proud of this school. Um, and I don't mean to seem as if I'm showing favoritism. Um, I've just watched so many of you grow up um, and transition from your, your, your times in either your immersion schools, whether Spanish immersion or a Cole Kenwood, and then grow up as seventh graders as my child did uh, through 12th at Columbus North International and experience um, the pleasures and the, the vicissitudes, the, the lulls, if you will, of that experience there, but come out, I mean, shining like gold, sparkling like the most, the most well-chiseled diamonds. And we all know that diamonds are made by heat, time, and pressure. So thank you for being diamonds in the district. Uh, my quick question to you all is, um, considering the transition into the new building in the past year and some change, um, what is it that you'd like to see paid forward in that space for uh, your, your student colleagues that you'll actually be leaving on? Um, we're going through an FMP process and I'd love to get some feedback from you on how we can improve our facilities at Columbus North International. Okay. Um, do we have a question for them? Was that a question? That was a question. Okay. Alexa, Tommy. Thank you for your question. Um, I think right now the transition has been pretty smooth and everything. Um, I haven't really noticed anything that needs more improvement, but I'm sure there there's more room for improvement anywhere. Um, I really can't think of anything off the top of my head. No worries, no worries. I thank you so much. Very proud of you, Ms. Aduna. <laughs> thank you so much, international students. So great to see you and hear about your school. Ms. Pruitt? Yeah, so thank you once again, Tommy and Alexa. Um, we will now hear from Independence High School. Pride in the eye. Good afternoon, President Adair, Vice President Reyes, Dr. Dixon, Treasurer Berhork, Internal Auditor Smith, and members of the board. My name is Sophia Ball. I am a junior at Independence High School in Fort Harris Career Center. I'm a student representative in different organizations such as IWoman, which is a woman leadership group at um, Independence High School Student Council. I'm also a student ambassador, and I'm also a Skills USA chapter president at Fort Hayes Career Center. I'm a four-point student athlete. I play volleyball. Hello, my name is Layla Castle. I am a first year student ambassador. I am a junior at Independence High School in Fort Hayes Career Center, also in the health science program. Um, I'm a student representative for iWomen as well and the National Honor Society. I will be inducted tomorrow. Um, and I'm also a student ambassador representing Independence High School. And I'm a 4.0 student athlete. I am the captain of the varsity volleyball, softball, and bowling team. As you all know, COVID has been a struggle for coaches, student athletes, students, teachers, everyone, even the community. And right here, we have one of our coaches explaining what's going on with their team and what's going on with them because it's complicated for everyone. Did the pandemic push away athletes or did the pandemic bring them together like more of the team? Um, I think it, it brought them together more because they had to, they didn't get as much time together, mm -hmm. but you know, like they usually did have a locker room, like I said, yeah. but now I thought that they either interacting more through phone, they talk more Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, 
they had to rely on, you know, actually talking to each other now because yeah. you don't get the in-person time. So they, they were calling more, I believe. And I don't think, I think it may have pushed some athletes. I don't think it pushed athletes away. I think they just may not have known about the information or yeah. known that. like one person that supported you or that group that supported you in the Huta? If yes, who? If no, why? Yes, and the person who helped me, her name is Coach Johnson. Mm -hmm. And basically, she was just helping me, making sure I was doing all the questions, staying on top of my grade in sports. We also have another student here. He's a freshman and he gave us a little more insight about how he's dealing with the pandemic, especially now. All right, I'm Layla. Layla, what's your name? Rosenberg. All right, and today I'm just gonna ask you one question, okay? Going through COVID, did you have that one person or group of people that supported you in the school staff? If yes, who? If no, why not? And what can we do to change that? Yes, and the coaches and my friends on the team. So we just basically stayed up to date with each other and we just stayed in touch and made sure everybody was okay, that we're going to throw up on the sports community. And make sure everybody was doing good in school because that's important. And just like make sure everybody's doing good in the All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answer, my guys. Okay. Throughout the school day, we came to the conclusions that our like students' mental health has gotten worse due to the pandemic because they're not used to being at home. They're not used to doing stuff by them by themselves. They're used to being out with people, and due to like school being moved to online, it made them more unmotivated. They made it made them procrastinate, especially me because this year really. I really kind of, I, I struggled a lot and as for our like teachers and coaches it was harder harder for them because they couldn't interact with students in person they had to learn how to adapt we both learned we both had to learn to adapt and change different ways of change our ways of learning We want to give a special thanks to Mr. Owens, Coach Williams, Capri Dawkins, Roosevelt Tutter, Dr. Toller, who is our new principal this year, Mr. Current, Mama Mia, Coach Z. Thank you so much for your support. We wouldn't ha we wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. 76ers are pride and I. Integrity, intelligence, and involvement. And I also wanted to say thank you to everyone that was here today and allowed us the opportunity to have a conversation with you, even if it wasn't in person. It's an honor to talk to you all. What she said. Thank you so much. Layla and Sophia, wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you. You all have just done such a wonderful job. I love pride in the eye. Um, yes. So, you know, just another wonderful example into the board. Just, you know, I hope that you have had, um, have enjoyed hearing from the students again um, to d this evening, I'm sorry, this evening, but the, the students are really just a joy to work with. Um, each and every other week that um, that we come together. So again, if you have any questions for Sophia and Layla. There is a question, uh, two questions. So we'll start with board member Raglan and then board member Cole. I just want to thank uh, all of our students uh, for their presentations this evening. It was, it was wonderful seeing the different flavors as we went from school to school Everyone has some different points of emphasis that were each uh, articulated very, very well. But one thing I saw across the board was a commitment to excellence. 
even in the midst of this pandemic where, uh, you know, a couple of my colleagues uh, have mentioned that there are some tremendous challenges, you young people have done just a tremendous job of looking at excellence as the standard. And uh, it showed tonight in all of your presentations. Ms. Pruitt, thank you uh, for continuing this work. Thank you for continuing to bring these young people before us. You all are the heart of our district. And I just love the fact that we're able to get these presentations from our students. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I enjoyed them thoroughly. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Board Member Cole. Thank you uh, very quickly. Um, I just want to say to you youngsters that you are just an august representation of your schools and your school district. You guys gave an outstanding presentation. Um, you have some, you filled obviously some big shoes. There were some students who came before you maybe a year or two ago who actually lobbied city council to get sidewalks built in the community. You guys represent that type of advocacy, that type of efficacy, that type of voice for yourselves and your colleagues. So I'm really proud of you. Quick question. Um, again, we're going through an FMP process in the school district. Um, uh, independence is probably one of, outside of the new schools that have been built, probably one of the more recent schools within the 40 years, within past 40 plus years. Um, actually a little more than that, uh, almost 50 years. But either way, um, wanted to see if you had any comments about how we can look at improving the schools there, the, your school at Independence. And again, I, I love pride in the eye, baby. I love it. Um, for, the, for the past, like I've been, I've been at Independence the past three years and every year the school is changing. Last year we got a new gym, which which is really, which is really grateful. Our gym looks better than ever right now. Um, I feel like the one thing for me would probably be air conditioning or like actually like getting some light because our windows doesn't, some of our windows in the other classes doesn't open or like getting some heat in the building because you, you can go from one side of the building and it could be hot and stuffy on one side. The other side can be cold. And I feel like certain students deal with that because I'm anemic and I can't be too cold. I, I don't like being too cold, but I don't like being too hot. You know, we got to find a balance. I don't know if it's like that for other people, but like, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, so out of the physical, I would really like to see the teachers interacting with the students more. We do have, there are a few new teachers that actually interact with their students a lot more. As we said, we thank Mr. Owens because he actually helped us with one of our presentations. And my sister went this to this school. She graduated 2016. And she fought to keep the doors of independence open and I'm really glad she did. It's, it's, it's a struggle, but we're getting through it one day at a time. And that's really all you can do. As one of my teachers here taught me, you can only go day by day. That, that's all you can really do. Thank you so much students from independence. Uh, it was a great presentation. Dr. Dixon, Ms. Pruitt, back to you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Dixon. Wow, thank you again, students and um, board members. You all said it. This is a just a small representation of the talent that we have in our district, and the students do such a great job representing themselves and their and their school and the district. So we are proud of you. Continue on, and when you get these questions for the board members, when they want to know your thoughts, hey, share your thoughts and your ideas. Um, because you never know what the, the difference that may make. It could mean something, you know, a new building, do something for you guys. So when you've given this opportunity, speak up. So thank you for that. And again, thank you, Ms. Ford, for always preparing our students, taking the time to make sure that they are prepared and represent the district well. So really appreciate all the work that you do and the time that you place in making sure that our students are prepared. You're welcome. And thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. I can't say enough about how fortunate yeah. I am to work with the students. So thank yeah. you. You're welcome. So finally, I would like to introduce our Chief Engagement Officer, Ms. Alicia Gillison, who will provide an update on our efforts to get our senior students across the finish line to graduation. 
We have just seven, seven weeks. weeks. Yes. Sorry, sorry. I have an echo one. One moment. Okay. <laughs> we have just seven weeks left in the school year. And our teachers and staff are hard at work providing additional supports and assistance to our seniors. The class of 2021 has endured an unprecedented array of challenges over the past year. From the onset of the pandemic at the end of their junior year to remote learning year, not to mention all of the social duress and political divisiveness that has encompassed our world lately. It's safe to say that this senior class has faced more obstacles outside of the classroom than any other. So tonight we have Ms. Gillison to tell us more about where we are with our seniors and the supports, supports that, that we are, are providing. providing. Ms. Gillison. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dixon and good evening, President Adair and uh, members of the board. And I want to thank you, Dr. Dixon, for giving us an opportunity to share where we are. And um, there's a lot of information in this presentation. So, and but I think before the end of it, you will know exactly where we are. And to realize where we are today is not where we're going to be. Hmm. I don't know what that was about. It's not where we're going to be tomorrow. So as we go through our presentation, all right, I apologize for that. Not quite sure what's going on here. So let's try it again. So as we get started, we want to talk about in CCS, the whole is greater than the sum of all of our individual parts and pieces. When we talk about Columbus City Schools and the, Colum and the city of Columbus, it's all of us coming together and leaning in to, for our students. No one department or one group of people. That's why I appreciate Dr. Dixon um, asking the Department of Engagement to link, align, and grow these supports for our students in these tumultuous times from um, academics to accountability, to our community partners, to our principals, teachers, counselors, everyone working together on behalf of our young folks. So we talk about supporting our seniors. So let's talk about what we're gonna get, what we're gonna get to tonight. Tonight's presentation will include uh, the challenges of change for this class of 2021. And Dr. Dixon did a great job of alluding to some of that. We're also gonna give a current snapshot of our senior success. And then what was the impact of House Bill 67, not only for Columbus, but for the entire state of Ohio. And then we'll get into the multiple supports for our seniors. And of course, board, by the end, there will be an opportunity for questions. So when you think about challenges, and Dr. Dixon alluded to that, let me just begin with some level setting. Um, she talked about our students being impacted at the end of their junior year and remote all the way up into their senior year. I wanna put that in context because we know that's happening, but did we know that that was 13 months? Did we think about it like that? That our students were out for 13 months. And during that time, there was the loss of lives, jobs, food insecurity, and uh, there was a verdict today because there was a lot of social injustice. And all of that was impacting our young people. But to get right down to it, resilience doesn't even begin to describe the grit and the determination of our young people. So, I want to take a snapshot. And so the data that we want to share with you today is a snapshot. So let's look at where our Columbus City Schools class of 2021 stand right now. And let me emphasize that this is a snapshot. Just like if you take a picture with your phone, it's a moment in time where they are today. It's not where they're going to be tomorrow. 
So I have the pleasure of introducing our uh, two of our academic performance analysts who have been working with our uh, support our seniors team and mining and pooling data and working with their regions, the principals in their regions. At this time, I won't introduce them. I will let them introduce themselves. Good evening. Thank you, Chief Gillison, for setting us up. I'm Lindsay Survey, an academic performance analyst and a member of the accountability team. My colleagues and I have been coordinating Support Our Seniors data requests and creating Support Our Seniors data reports. Data in the following slides was collected between April 12th and April 19th, and it's sourced from Infinite Campus reports and senior support teams. We collected Support Our Seniors data previously on February 12th, March 12th, and March 29th, and we'll report again on May 3rd and May 17th. While we are primarily reporting on the progress and success of cohort 2021 students tonight, there are also cohort 2020 students who may graduate this school year. Students in cohort 2020 affect the district's five-year graduation rate on the state report card. Of 138 students in cohorts are in grades in grade 23, receive special education services. They continue with us after their 12th grade year for social emotional, workplace, and community placement opportunities. Of the students in cohorts 2020 and 2021, more than 95% of them are cohort 2021 students. These 2,727 students determine the district's four-year graduation rate. Data on the following slides represents only cohort 2021 students. As of April 19th, 53.98% of Columbus City Schools cohort 2021 students are on track to graduate. Cohort 2021 students are considered on track if they are passing all scheduled courses necessary to graduate, require no credit recovery, and have not failed any semester one courses. Columbus City Schools Board of Education provided further flexibility toward meeting graduation requirements in 2021 by eliminating requirements for the internship credit, technology credit, and academic elective credit. The percentage of cohort 2021 students who are on track to graduate varies by region. And in some regions, the on-track percentage exceeds the district total. In region two, 58.86% are on track. In region four, 55.33% are on track. And in region six, 61.88% are on track. Next, my colleague, Sarah Andreas, will share the percent of cohort 2021 students who were on track to graduate during previous reporting periods, as well as current on-track data disaggregated by student groups. Thank you, Lindsay. This graph displays the on-track, off-track data for the district for previous and current reporting periods. The on-track percentages for the previous months were February 12th, 54.37%, March 12th, 53.29%, March 29th, 59.06%, and currently April 19th at 53.98%. Changes to graduation requirements as a result of House Bill 67 and board changes resulted in updated on-track criteria. The updated on-track criteria is reflected in the changes in on-track percentages between March 29th and April 19th. This slide represents cohort 2021 student groups. Disaggregated data allows us to identify how each student group performs compared to all students and to examine equity. Many groups are similar to the district on-track percentage or even outperforming the district, such as the Black non-Hispanic group, at 55.19% and students who have IEPs 
at 55 point, at, I'm sorry, at 56.05% on track. So no number is really where we want them to be, but there is much individual success and lots to be proud of behind these numbers. The state of Ohio reports that fewer students are applying to college this year. Nevertheless, nearly 1,000 cohort 2021 students have applied to college. And in fact, they've completed more than 5,000 applications. So far, they've earned nearly $24 million in scholarships and grants. Many more dollars will be awarded in coming months. The free application for federal student aid or FAFSA applications have also decreased across the nation this year. However, more than 800 students have completed the federal application for college funds here at CCS. There are millions of dollars still to be awarded, which is why the FAFSA is being emphasized as a part of the Senior Fest event tomorrow. And now I will pass the presentation to Kenny Lee. Thanks, Sarah. So what did our snapshot reveal? What do we need to be focused on at the district and building levels? First, we can see that staying on track is not a constant. Throughout the school year, high school principals regularly see groups of students, those close to the bubble, even those who have been good over multiple quarters ebb and flow between on track and off track. For our students, life altering events, many of which are beyond their control, impacts their graduation status. Inconsistent attendance and poor performance, even in a single class, can quickly put a senior off track. At the same time, this is also when many of our seniors are stepping up and doing what they need to do in order to attend events like prom and to sit alongside their classmates and graduate. For those of us who have done this work, we know this is the final push, the last mile of the race, the final five minutes of the quarter. In April and May, the on-track numbers change daily, even hourly, as credit recovery courses are completed and transcribed and students complete work for their regular courses. As we close in on graduation, our on-track number will improve. Second, the data shows that our seniors struggled during the winter quarter. Perhaps that's not a surprise to you because even pre-pandemic, second and third quarters are always the toughest for our students. During this year's third quarter, our seniors were also in transition, moving from full remote into a hybrid learning model. Despite the struggle, we are continuing to provide our students and our graduation teams with wraparound supports from school counselors, social workers, teachers, administrators, and community partners in order for students to pass their current courses and complete credit recovery. Third, our snapshot showed and our data analysts highlighted some examples of on-track success by region and demographic group. However, the data also identified the continued need for academic supports for all students, but especially directed at our Hispanic and English language learner students. Many of these students live in homes where we are more likely to see parents and family members struggle with the graduation process and the different requirements. We need these parents to be partners in our senior support efforts. So it is important that we continue to leverage internal and community multilingual resources to further engage these parents in moving students from off track to on track. Fourth and finally, this data gives us the ability to continue course corrections. Find out specifically what moves our seniors off track and get them back on track with targeted resources and supports. Sometimes these course corrections work for the entire school year. Sometimes the resources and supports need to change monthly, weekly, even daily, depending on the student challenges. At this point, the graduation process, our administrators, teachers, and counselors at the building level will continue to pinpoint the specific needs that will continue to adapt to get our seniors over the graduation line and ultimately to walk this stage. And I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Mitchell, who's gonna talk about a state support that came to our seniors. Thank you, Kenny. Support for all Ohio seniors also came from the State House. With the passage of House Bill 67, aligned with the trend across the nation that acknowledged the trauma, burdens, and hurdles 
the pandemic placed on our country. I wanna go over the summary of House Bill 67. This bill provides flexibility for graduation requirements, allows grades 11 and 12 to use end of course grades instead of mandated tests to fulfill graduation requirements, extends end of year testing window, waives the American history assessment, and as the Ohio Meets Jobs Readiness Sill as a graduation pathway for the class of 2021. While there are many provisions allowed in House Bill 67, the most exciting point to keep in mind is that any CCS student may graduate this year if they complete the required 20 course requirements. And with that, I will pass it back to Mr. Lee. Thanks, Bill. So going back to the senior supports, from a school level and from an academic perspective, we want to ensure that the provided supports align to the district's multi-tiered systems of support. From the MTSS lens to better support the needs of our current seniors, as well as those students who will soon be called seniors, we have focused and prioritized our curriculum across all content areas, acknowledging that virtual and hybrid instruction is different for both students and teachers. This tier one support applies to all of our high school students. In addition, we have implemented student success plans as a tier two support. The student success plans systematically provide students with the opportunity to improve their grades through collaboratively created plans between teachers, students, and parents. Finally, as we continue to close in on graduation, building level teams are identifying those students with the greatest graduation needs and providing close, intensive, in-person support in a tier three approach. Bill? Thank you, Kenny. Each school has a senior support team complete with building administrators, teachers, counselors, coaches, and partners who are working collaboratively to support our seniors. Our school counselors have been working with our students on their graduation plans and ensuring that all students and their families are aware of what students need to graduate. School teams are also working to engage families in multiple ways through text, emails, monthly newsletters, calls, and in addition, our school counselors and other support professionals have held senior support days and boot camps for credit recovery and credential completion. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Chief Gillison. I was on mute and steady oh. going. All right, can we go back one slide, please? So we talk about uh, supports at home. We have the We Care Wednesday check and connect calls where we're actually calling the families of our seniors, sharing with them all of the supports in the school buildings, out at the learning extension centers. And we are also going around placing door hangers on the doors for families. And one side, it's in multiple languages. And then we have the information in English. So we're reaching out to our families to make sure they have all the information that they need. And then, as you know, we have our virtual family engagement sessions every Tuesday and Thursday. And Thursdays uh, are our super sessions where the superintendent joins us. And we've also had some of our seniors on those sessions. The community learning extension centers and the senior support centers. Those learning extension centers that are set up specifically to support our seniors, they've been trained on credit recovery and they're ready to focus on the needs of our students. So in going through all of that information, um, a charge or a, um, how do I wanna say it? A, a call to action 
for the community is to continue to work with Columbus City Schools because our kids are absolutely amazing. Dr. Dixon prefaced it with this class has gone through more than any other class has gone through when you think about their year of graduation. So we have June graduation coming up in seven weeks. And then we have August graduation coming up. And for those students that need that extra time, we also have that extended fifth year graduation for our young people. So it's never time to give up and never time to stop. We don't stop. We're gonna be here for them every step of the way. So at this time, I will open up for uh, questions and our team's here to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much team for the presentation. Uh, we do have questions from the board. First board member Raglan, then board member Beckerly, and then Dr. Pierce, board member Raglan. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Chief Gillison and your team uh, for a, a very thorough presentation. Uh, you mentioned the fifth year extended uh, graduation piece. Um, I am hopeful uh, that as we understand the gravity of the pandemic and uh, the role that it has played to uh, really give our students some tremendous challenges that we use uh, specifically the additional resources that are coming uh, from the state and the federal government to implement uh, some sort of continued observation of our students even past uh, graduation or their first year away from the district. Uh, for me, um, we know that our students have experienced some challenges with working uh, very diligently to get them up to and through graduation. I love the emphasis on the FAFSA that's going to occur at Senior Fest, um, but I would like to see us devote some resources to tracking students at least three years after they separate from the district, either through graduation or through other means. I think it's important for us to know um, not only that we've sent students to college, but that they've gone to college and some of the supports that they've needed that got them to college would in some way be able to continue. And, you know, with you leading our engagement department, I think it's a, it's a much bigger effort than just the, the Board of Education and just CCS. That would take a community-wide effort. But I think with the pandemic and all of the information that we know, we've got the justification uh, for continuing that. We understand that our students are very special and their needs are unique. And this is something that we could say, we're gonna put a bit more emphasis behind making certain that on into the future, our students are having a great start and that it doesn't just stop with district support uh, once they graduate. Have you had any discussions with folks within the community concerning that type of an effort? I know I've been calling for it for a while, but I think these, these additional federal and state resources are a good opportunity for us to kind of kick that off um, with, with, a, with a shot in the arm on some, on some funding for it. But I'm interested in your, in your thoughts uh, on that specifically. And thank you again for, uh, for this very detailed report. And thank you so much. Uh, and for that question, so we have the National Clearinghouse data um, and we work very closely with, I know I can. So we track those students that are going off to college. Um, also in that senior fest, we're gonna have that FAFSA room with FAFSA and college applications, but we're also gonna have a room for those students interested in the military. And we're gonna have a room for those students that wanna get straight out into the workforce. So working with the, the amazing, um, our academic performance analyst and the amazing academic team and accountability team, we can look at putting some measures in place because we've got the part for um, college, those students going to college, and I know I can is there with us every step of the way on that, but those other pieces that we also want to make sure that we're capturing. So thank you for that, and that's something that we'll take back to the team, and when I say this team is so very, very talented, and I'm so proud and just honored to be able to work with them. So thank you for your question, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you again, Chief Gillison. That concludes my questions, uh, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Raglan. Next up is Board Member Beckerly. Um, I, I don't know that I particularly have a question. Um, these numbers are obviously very sobering. 
Um, they're entirely to be expected. You know, this is what a pandemic does, especially one of the magnitude and um, the uh, seriousness of the one that we've just, we are still experiencing. Um, and I think that the only other thing I wanna share um, is that uh, we, you need to, you, the administration, Dr. Dixon, uh, Chief Gilson, we need to know what you need the board to do to support you in whatever um, creative and out of the box, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know what we have to do to chase down these kids that, you know, would ordinarily have graduated and, you know, sell this fifth year option. And it may be a community thing. It may be what we do join forces with city council. I don't, you know, we get F athletes or I don't know how we do this, but we have, because I, I've been in involved in that rush to get kids across the aisle to um, Mr. Lee's point when, um, those numbers change and they change, they're changing on the day of graduation. And I've been part of that process. Um, so I appreciate that, but we have to get that kind of energy and um, export it to the kids that, you know, through whatever personal reasons, you know, it doesn't matter why we have to come up with a plan. And I want you to feel free to come to us and say, this is a crazy idea, but we want to do it because we think it'll bring in X number of students. So I, I, I just want to encourage that um, and, and let us know whether it's creating an ad hoc committee that's just focused on it, whatever makes sense um, that we can take advantage of this fifth year option and the summer too. I mean, I'm sure there's a cohort that we can roll up our sleeves and get across the aisle in August. Um, Absolutely. And thank you, um, board member Beckley. First, I want to thank the board because you all have been there part of the We Care Wednesdays, when you're calling those senior parents, that's part of it. The Senior Fest opportunities to get kids excited. Uh, senior Fest is kicking off uh, our second virtual tomorrow. And we have a special guest to get students excited. You may not know him, but someone in the listening audience conceded from while and out, the kids love him. We actually have him. He will be there talking about FAFSA and telling our kids, you know, motivating them to make it through. But you're right. This is something bigger and broader. And I love the way you prefaced it and Kit and Lee shared it. Where we are today is not where we were yesterday when you look at the data and it's not where we're going to be tomorrow. So those numbers will continue to change and we will continue working with our young people and our community partners have been there every step of the way. Uh, the city of Columbus, Columbus Urban League. So we'll continue working hard because these numbers are not an indictment on our kids. It's an indictment of the situation that we're in because of COVID. And we all realize that. So thank you. And, 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 and I just wanna add, and I think that the next year, the next few months are critical to try to draw them back in as we come out of the pandemic. Yes. Because we, you know, and, and that's exactly right. All right. So if you know someone that knows Conceited, tell them Conceited um, will be featured and he will actually be there on the Senior Fest tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Beckerley, over to Dr. Pierce. So first, let me say thank you to our administration for this very thorough analysis and evaluation of where our seniors for class of 2021 stand. Um, having asked the question of what is our percentage of seniors who have signed their graduation plans, what percentage of our seniors are ready to graduate since December, I am happy and pleased with the information that was shared today. I think our community is better informed. The questions that I have for you are going to challenge you, but integrate some of the comments from our public comment session um, and, and hopefully um, create uh, some more thoughtful reflection and review 
on how we can move forward when it comes to our seniors, but also with our goals and guardrails. So with that said, our um, speaker today uh, raised the point that our goals um, seemed low. And so one, I also want to take the position to say um, in our past meetings, when we were discussing the goals and guardrails as a board, we asked you, Dr. Dixon, and your administrative team, if the goals that were listed on page 55 of our MTSS um, administrative guide in 2020 and 2021 were, were off, off a little bit, if you wanted to change and tweak those. And so with our goals that you have presented, um, it, the tweaking is evident and it's clear that it's there. So I want, want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. When we look at those goals, one of the goals that we have that relates to our senior class is that goal um, number three, close opportunity gaps, right? And right there, it says that our four-year graduation cohort students will complete state and district graduation requirements, and it will increase from 81.4% in the August of 2020, um, or decline due to COVID, um, to 86% in August of 2026. Based upon the analysis, the quick analysis that I'm doing based upon your PowerPoint presentation that showed the demographic breakdown based upon our student groups, I'm anticipating, or it looks like we might be at a, around a 72, 73% graduation rate for our students. Um, I wanna get a firmer understanding of where our team is expecting our graduation rate to fall. Am I correct in that assessment? Do we think we'll get to that um, 81.4? Are we gonna hover around that 72, 73%? If I can just kind of start and then, I don't know if there's a, a member on the team that, that wants to join. Uh, when we were at the 81.4 uh, and the year before that, 82, we have formal and informal systems in place working with our young people. COVID kind of took that away from them. So we are shooting for, you know, I don't wanna say 70, we're gonna shoot for the best that we can get for our young people. And if we don't get them in June, we are not gonna stop. We're gonna continue for August graduation because both of those June and August, for those that aren't familiar, that will be an indication and a graduation rate for the class of 2021. We have two graduations and we're gonna keep working hard, exhaustively hard. The, the teams in the buildings, the teams in, in central office, we don't stop. We continue to work to make sure our kids get there. Um, so yes, we're gonna shoot for the moon. And if we hit the stars, then that's okay, but we're gonna shoot for it. Um, Dr. Pierce, because we have to create these formal and informal systems. We have to go back and reestablish those systems that were peeled away once COVID hit and students had to learn remote and students were disconnected with everything going on in their atmosphere. So does that, um, is that reflected accurately in the language that we're using in number three's goal? And, and this is just a question that that could be asked, that could be answered later. Like, do we need to tweak the language of that, um, tweak the language of that goal to accurately describe we're looking at the June and the August graduation rates? So to clarify that. Dr. Pierce, mm -hmm. thank you for your question so very, very much. You know how near and dear this is to my heart. What I wanna share with you is based on past trajectories, and a 5% decline with regard to COVID, it is our best guesstimate that we will be at about 75% graduation rate right. by the end of May. So you are pretty darn close to where we are. Um, I can tell you though, Columbus City School students, if you look at the difference between the June graduation rate and the August graduation rate, our students always come through. It might take them a little bit longer but they always come through. So we are expecting from our June rate to our August rate, which remember that counts as a four-year graduation rate. So we are expecting to obtain up to a 78% by August of 21. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Klein and Chief Gillison. I appreciate that. My second question then goes to our guardrails. And, and this is interesting and help clarify this for me. When we look at guardrail, interim guardrail 3.1, that um, correlation between the annual budget allocation and the district developed metric for student need will increase from zero in May 2021 to 0.6 by June 2023. When I saw the demographic or the breakdown for our, our different student populations, I wondered and would like to know, will any of those funds be targeted to, for example, our Hispanic students, our, Eng our English language learning students, because as I see how they're performing in terms of those graduation rates, can we earmark more money for them to help boost that percentage that we're seeing and expecting to see? I think Dr. Pierce, that's a fabulous question. Can we pin that for a discussion when we talk about the goals and guardrails? Because I think that that might include different people than are here. So can, can you put a pin in that and re-ask that in like maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes? Definitely. And I think um, that then connects to, and this isn't a question, this is more of a statement. I think what tonight's presentation showed our community is that as we're moving to advanced student learning, we're doing it at the same time that we are really being intentional about equity. And in some of these situations, we're going to have to make a tough decision. And, you know, there's going to be um, some buy-in um, to move and, and reallocate resources with the goal of increasing um, student learning. But there's going to be some give and take in this situation. And tonight's presentation, I think, showed us just a little bit of, of that analysis that will need to happen on a more regular basis for us to really begin to understand how student achievement is moving in our district. And so with that statement in mind, I end by requesting if we could start seeing this type of analysis at our June meeting for our upcoming class, that would be absolutely phenomenal. So by this June, if we can see what's anticipated for our 2022 class, I mean, we are, that, that would be absolutely phenomenal. It, it shows the level and the complexity of the work that we're doing to get our students across the stage. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. You're welcome. And we will go to board member Cole. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I have a question about uh, the student follow-up. We are doing community work right now. We're engaged in kind of an all hands on deck community piece in partnership with a local organization, National Center for Urban Solutions. At some point in time, I, I would love to have some sort of update on where we are with those efforts. What, what is uh, the ROI, the turnaround, the, you know, uh, the outcome, if you will, anticipated or current of, you know, where we are with that partnership and that endeavor. I know it's a noble one. I know they're the right group to do it, but let's, I'd love to get some some insight on where we are with that. Okay, thank you, Board Member Cole. Um, I do want to also say that I thought the data presentation was really great. I liked this aggregated data. I do echo what Dr. Pierce said. This is something we will start to do more. I know um, it is the only way to really understand and address equity, um, and we all have to learn that um, you know, it's okay to do that. Um, so I do appreciate that. And I know that we will incorporate that uh, going forward. Um, and there are any final questions? Oh, for, uh, Vice President Reyes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Ms. Gilson. Uh, as I was out um, delivering some of the graduation signs and talking to our students, um, I really heard a lot of our students and I think it is based on the impact of COVID, talking about um, going and working, right? Um, so one of the things that popped into my head was, is that, uh, I believe that could be because they wanna help their families, right? That have been impacted by COVID. 
my fear, and I hope um, that our work and the message is out there, is that uh, we might have some students kind of giving up, right? Saying, well, I've got to go to work. I didn't hit it in May. I didn't hit it in June. So I appreciate um, the opportunity, though obviously we want, to, want them to finish this year. I, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity for the fifth year. How are we communicating that fifth year option to the students that may not be on track? Because I, I really don't want to say, hey, you know, you don't finish this year, go to fifth. I want to say, let's all finish this year. But um, if we have this data, we know which, which students um, may need a little bit more work. How are we communicating that to those students? The first step was uh, making the phone calls to the parents and actually going out to the homes. And you're ab absolutely correct. You saw it when you were delivering um, yard signs. Uh, we have, we partnered with um, NCUS and we also had our safety and security officers going out to homes. We're making phone calls because we're not uh, touting a fifth year option. I mean, it's a reality, it's there but our students really want to graduate with the class of 2021. And they have two opportunities to do that. They have the June opportunity and the August opportunity. And remember, it's only one graduation rate. It just rolls June and August into that graduation rate. So we are uh, making phone calls, we are doing home visits, we are passing out door hangers for those students who weren't at home and need this information. But most of all, our building principals and our counselors are standing by. And Bill mentioned it, they're reaching out to those families because you're absolutely correct, uh, Vice President Reyes. Uh, our, a lot of our students have had to take on jobs. So then there is the Apex Credit Recovery Option where they can go to the Senior Success Centers. Then we have these community centers set up for them. They can do credit recovery in, in, in the comforts of their home, at work, on break. But we're sharing with them that we are providing opportunities for them to graduate and graduate in either June or August. And for those that just can't make June or August, then there's that fifth year. Thank you, Ms. Gilson. I've also been uh, in my other um, full-time role uh, I've talked to a couple of employers um, that are really interested in hiring a lot of our Columbus City School students. As we know, COVID has impacted the workforce. There is uh, more jobs, less people. So they're really concerned about their recruitment efforts. Um, are there, and I thought maybe this might be a good opportunity for those students that may want to go to work. Are we having any conversations with these employers uh, to possibly say if that if that student is suggesting to drop out or doesn't have their um, diploma, is there some sort of um, opportunity for for that student to continue in their studies while they're going to to work? You know, kind of like an apprentice type of um, credit recovering to ensure that our students eventually get. Um, their degree. For those that are struggling, again, I know that I'm still shooting for everybody graduating uh, at the end of the year, but uh, as I talk to those employers, they're very interested in paying students to study, to work, apprenticeships. Is there an opportunity to start those conversations? As you stated, we're inviting some employers to talk to our students. Can we put some sort of bug in those employers? years to ensure that our students are, have graduated as they consider their employment? Thank you for that question. And, and what I can share at this time is there are some conversations and some brainstorms, uh, brainstorming going around those very ideas they, that you were mentioning, um, incentivizing finishing this year. You know, if, if I have to, you know, go and make money to bring it home to help, what if I am incentivized by getting finished this year and I'm still mm -hmm. able to pull in a paycheck by getting that done? I will say there are some initial or preliminary conversations. We have not signed on to anything. It's just uh, brainstorming sessions 
and it's uh, it's good information. And um, I think some of those conversations will come to fruition. It could be a difference of a dollar raise, right? Uh, uh, we'll start you here. If you don't have your uh, diploma, we'll give you this dollar raise if you uh, provide us a, a diploma within six or seven months. Um, the last, uh, well, uh, this is a two-part question. As I was, again, uh, delivering signs to some of our students, um, many of our students did not, um, had not completed their FAFSA. And then many of the students still had questions about scholarships. Could you repeat a little uh, uh, again, how and where uh, our students can continue even now and even after uh, tomorrow's Senior Fest in getting information on filling out their FAFSA and if there's any continued opportunities for scholarships? Yes and yes. And thank you for that question. Um, so Senior Fest tomorrow, there's going to be four, four rooms and each room has a theme and support in the room. And there's one room specifically for uh, FAFSA completion and uh, college applications and all of that good information. And you know, our college access partners, I know I can have been really instrumental in helping us pull these pieces together. Um, there's a, a, a room for, I spoke with some young people, they're interested in going into the military, but they don't know how to go about doing it and they want to hear more. So these are recruiters that are going to be in there. They are near peers who graduated a couple of years ago who went off to the service and it's meant everything for their lives, just to kind of share that information. And then there is a room where we're gonna share employment information with students. There's gonna be a job board and they click that job board. Uh, we just got information from the Columbus Zoo and they are having a big job fair on the 24th of this month. And then uh, Urban League has some jobs. So when our kids finish, yes, we have a push on getting through graduation, but then it's what's next. You know, what comes after graduation? What happens when you wake up, you graduate June 3rd, what happens when you wake up on June 4th? What do you have? Are you going to college? Are you going to the military? Or are you going to work to continue supporting and helping your family? And Ms. Gillison, my last question, uh, knowing for well that all of this is virtual, and um, I know there's a lot of parents that are still not comfor comfortable with the virtual world. If a parent has a question about a senior and all these services that we are providing, where would that parent and who would that parent um, contact? The first line of uh, defense or the first, the parent should reach out to the school counselor and the building principal. And in the event that they, um, for whatever reason, can't get in touch with them, then I would offer, and, uh, and our team is standing by ready, I would offer for them to call 614-365-8868, because it's never too late. And 8868, that's easy to remember for parents, it's never too late. So give a call and let us work together to make sure your child has the supports that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate this presentation so very much. Uh, back to uh, Dr. Dixon. Uh, thank you. That concludes my um, superintendent's report for this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, team. Um, let's go ahead and go over to our internal auditor. Hello, Auditor Smith. Good evening, President Adair. Um, I do not have a report this evening, but I do have a brief announcement. Audit and Accountability is going to be meeting this Thursday. Uh, we're going to be doing a hybrid, but for those in the listening audience, you can definitely uh, watch the meeting virtually, and that meeting will start at 3.30. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you so much, and we will head over to talk to with our treasurer. So, Mr. Treasurer. Thank you, and good evening. Um, I have for the board the financial report for March.
which you should be viewing right now. So this is the financial report from March. It was presented to the Finance and Appropriations Committee last week on the 14th. And they reviewed that report along with several other items on the agenda. For the month of, or year to date through the month of March, uh, revenues are up about 27 and a half million or about three, a little over 3%. And expenditures continue to uh, run under plan um, even more this month uh, and have reached 65 million under plan or about almost 9%. Um, and cash balance is, is uh, at 500 and almost 504 million at the end of March, uh, which is um, about 93 million above plan. This gives you a picture of our cash balance, how it's performed over the month and uh, over the year. And after the first of the year, uh, with that delay in property tax collection, you can see the cash balance um, is performing uh, and behaving uh, like it has in the past in terms of the month to month ups and downs, but we are uh, well above the plan at this point. Highlights uh, for March in the revenue category, property taxes uh, year to date stand at 6.4 million above plan. Uh, they actually came in with settlement this month. They were about 4.2 million under plan. And now that we're past uh, both settlements, um, we do stand at uh, 6.4 million uh, above plan. Um, we're expecting um, a bit more at, at this point, uh, this second half settle this second settlement in this fiscal year, which is really first half calendar 21, is only about 500,000 above um, the estimate for this settlement period. Uh, whereas the first settlement in this fiscal year, which was the second settlement in calendar year 20, uh, was um, around 5.9 million above plan. On the state funding side, we're 22.4 million year to date um, ahead of plan. As you might recall from uh, previous discussions, that 22 million is made up of about 19.5 uh, uh, million in that Bureau of Workers Comp uh, dividend. Um, payment. Without the Bureau Works uh, Workers' Compensation dividend, we'd be running about 2.9 million above plan. And at this point, you should also remember that uh, we've begun receiving a little bit more each month because they did a partial restoration of our um, reduction that started first in fiscal year 20 and then carried forward to this fiscal year. Uh, but they did um, um, restore a bit of that. Uh, beginning uh, a month ago. Property tax allocation, which is our rollback and homestead exemption that flows to us. Um, it's a it's a credit off of property taxes and flows to us through the state of Ohio. It's under planned by 3.9 million, uh, simply because uh, we anticipated getting it this month, or at least part of it this month, and we didn't. We should receive it uh, in the month of, of, in fact, we have received it in the month of April, and it will be pretty much on target when you get next month's report. Just a graphic look of where we are. I think revenues are, are uh, very much on plan for the year. And I do track for the, uh, the committee and, and, and these monthly state aid uh, flow. And you can see here in December, that Bureau of Work, Workers' Compensation dividend that created a, a blip in the graph. And then in February, that's the catch up payment when they restored the, um, a portion of the cut that was made uh, you can see it's hard to see in this graph because the, 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 the um, scale is so large, but that black dot for March, um, I don't see if you can, I can highlight this for you. Um, that black dot for March is ever so slightly above the plan and the equal, the, the equal monthly payment plan. Um, and that represents uh, just that spreading out of the um, um, restoration of the of the cut. So it's ever so slightly higher each each month, and that should continue for the balance of the fiscal year. These are the other revenues. Uh, you can see the property tax allocation is down, but that's timing. All other revenues, again, are related to pilots. Interestingly enough, while pilots are above plan year to date, our investment income is, is down about 2.6 million under our plan. Um, rates have been falling over the past year, and that's been the primary contribute to, contributor to that reduction. Um, I'm taking that into account in the, in the forecast by lowering the investment um, estimates in, into the future, but uh, you'll hear more of that next month. 
Our heat map on revenues, um, you can see that we were under plan, uh, 8.3 8 million under plan uh, during the month. So you see a lot of uh, unfavorable indicators there, more than usual. Uh, but on the year to date side, we're still very on plan or very favorable in most categories. Again, uh, the property tax um, indicator year to date is moderately to very unfavorable. Um, but that again is timing. But overall, you see in total revenues, we're very favorable in terms of dollar amount and moderately favorable in terms of our percent variance. On the expenditure side, year-to-date personnel uh, continues to run under plan by about 28 million year-to-date. Um, purchase services um, is running under plan as are all the other non-personnel lines. Keep in mind that our, our plan was based upon the budget amount. Uh, we are changing that uh, um, philosophy and preparing the five-year forecast. We're gonna make it more of a cash flow document than a budget document. So nonetheless, these reflect some of the um, uh, gains that we're making against the November uh, plan as well as our uh, November forecast, as well as our uh, cash flow plan for the year. Purchase services, again, under plan year to date by 20 million. Um, professional technical services, property services, electricity and tuition to other districts, top the year to date categories, they range from about 2.8 to 3.9 million under plan. And we have only really one item that's running very slightly uh, special ed tuition is running over plan by um, a whopping $44,000. A charter uh, continues to run under plan, um, uh, but um, I think that uh, we we could see that um, uh, grow smaller over time because, uh, or actually it'll, it'll grow smaller because the deduction is being increased because part of their uh, state revenue was restored to them as well. So a restoration of revenue to them is an increase in the expenditure to us. So we'll see that that uh, monthly amount increase slightly during the uh, rest of this, this year. Supplies and materials are, are running under plan as well. Um, software and fuel are running under as, as leaders in that category, about 1.9 million and 2.6 million respectively. Textbooks remain about 2 million over plan uh, year to date due to a previous um, large uh, textbook purchase earlier in the year. Um, and capital outlay, again, under plan this month, uh, but it's mainly technical equipment that's running under plan year to date. Just graphically, you can see the, the differences there against plan. And here, purchase services are obviously uh, the leader in terms of uh, running under plan overall. As you might expect with the, all the under plan variances, you can see here that we're in the green uh, on the heat map pretty much across the board. Um, and uh, the only unfavorable variances you see are in terms of uh, transfers and advances. And these are typically uh, smaller dollar amount items, but that can create a large uh, percent variances, which is why you see those very unfavorable percent variances there. But across the board, and this is essentially a change from last month, it's all on plan or very favorable in terms of variances on the expenditure side. I continue to make my comparisons to last year. Um, after we've received the settlement on our property taxes, you can see that compared to last year, we're about 3.7% above uh, where we were last year at this time. Um, state aid, interestingly enough, it's, um, uh, it's, it, is, it is up over um, last year. And, um, uh, but you have to keep in mind that that's in large part due to the uh, dividend from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation and we got that catch-up payment and how they restored that uh, previous reduction. And those two uh, have caused a, a blip over state aid. Otherwise, we had assumed that, that last year's reduced level would be identical for this year. And we would have been uh, pretty much unchanged from last year, except for those two uh, specific, specific events. Overall, uh, total revenue now just 4.3% above last year at this time. On the expenditure side, um, you can see here that personnel related items, both personal services, which is salaries and wages, that very first line, and benefits are be running behind where we were last year. A lot of the personal services, uh, the, the lines that contributed to that are overtime and substitutes at this point. Purchase services um, running behind uh, plan from last year, from where we were last year, charter schools, you can see about three and a half percent above last year. 
uh, supplies and materials are up uh, primarily due to that uh, textbook purchase. Um, I noted for the committee that fuel um, is actually running about 2.2 million behind last year, as you might e expect as transportation costs um, and activity have been down. In the kind of non-operating area, um, you can see that advances out are up year to date. And that has to do with the month to month cash flow advances that we make to a couple of funds, uh, primarily uh, the radio station fund and latchkey to this point. Overall, total expenditures, the yellow highlighted line is just 1.1% over where we were at this time last year. And you can see that, that compared to last year, um, we have a, a larger cash balance by about 85 million. So in closing, um, variances are all pretty much in the direction that we prefer to have them. Revenues are above plan, expenditures are running below plan. Um, and other than this report, the committee um, did hear the first presentation um, on the five-year forecast, the May five-year forecast update. And then embedded in that uh, presentation was um, a presentation on the five-year staffing plan that is contained in the, in the forecast. And the board will hear that forecast at their first board meeting in May and subsequently adopt the forecast at the second meeting in May. Um, other than that, um, that will complete my report. If I can stop sharing my screen now, that would help. So hang on, bear with me for a minute. Thanks, Dan. As you're doing that, let me ask board members, are there any questions or do any either of the uh, or the three members on the finance committee have anything to add? And I can't see everyone because Stan is still trying to stop right. sharing his screen. <laughs> This is the one time that uh, I don't know if, if Ryan hmm. can stop sharing my screen or not. Maybe I can, oh. I can hit stop. There we go. Look, okay, I have the power. <laughs> I've, I've uh, too many screens running. I couldn't find the little <laughs> drop down menu. My apologies, but. I didn't know I um, could do that. So now I do. So there we are. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, so I didn't see any board members if you had hands up or anything like that. Okay, oh, uh, board member Cole, did you have something? Uh, just very quickly, thank you, Treasurer Bohorek, for your presentation. Um, this side of our administration gives, again, um, deep due diligent thought to uh, how now how we not only stay in the black and leverage opportunities moving forward, um, but also helps us on the advocacy side. I really want to encourage my colleagues um, to uh, work with the administration to make us a leading voice in the state of Ohio for advocacy on school funding, for advocacy around school funding, particularly even that impacts our ability to draw down taxable revenues. Um, I know that there have been some recent developments, but I think that we can be that leading voice uh, for the state and galvanizing the state around issues that impact our bottom line. So. Uh, COVID and CARES Act dollars are not going to last forever, um, and we need to be prepared. I know we're doing that on our end uh, to ensure how we're looking to be in the black and be solvent in the next five years, as by law we're, we're supposed to do. Um, but I think it's time for us to continue to go above and beyond uh, by trying to be creative and identifying ways for us to draw down dollars. Real estate I think very entrepreneurially speaking is one of those ways in which we can do that, that I don't know of any school district really who's ever leveraged that opportunity or pulled that lever with their state legislature. Um, so with that in mind, thank you, Treasurer Bohorek, and uh, I look forward to continue our work moving forward. Thank you, uh, Board Member Cole. Any other questions or comments for the Treasurer? Seeing none, thank you so much for your report this evening. Thank you. Okay, we are now going to move over to the uh, 8.1 resolution to adopt Columbus City Schools portrait of graduate goals and guardrails for the district. Um, before I have Ramona read it, which then will prompt the discussion on it, please read it first and then we will discuss. I wanna make sure that board members know and the community knows 
that the documents are actually in board docs. I'm gonna to try to share my screen really fast so that you can uh, maybe. Uh, so the two documents we are looking at, the first one is the portrait of a graduate, which is our community vision. Um, and so I hope you can see that. And I think this little box here is, you can't see that, but it, it's a black box for you. I can't make it smaller. Go away, everyone. How do I make you all go away? But anyway, so you can see it, okay. All right, so we have uh, students leading the way, the portrait of a graduate. Remember, this is the thing that we worked on with Battelle and the community where we had all those discussions and we talked about what were, the, what were those um, really critical attributes that we wanted our students to have uh, as they were. We were thinking about the long-term vision of our district, ensuring that every student graduating from Columbus City Schools had these attributes. And those that the community selected were adaptability, communication, creativity, critical thinking, global empathy, and technology. So this is document one. So we are um, being asked to approve the vision of the district for the long-term long vision. The second document is, which I hope you can see as well, side by side, yes, shaking your head, yes, no, no. You can just see a portrait of a graduate, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and reshare and share the second document. I can see them side by side, but you cannot. All right, the second document is the goals and guardrails. Um, so now you should be able to see that one. The goals and guardrails um, are the board's goals and guardrails. So this sets our, our, uh, our agenda in, in terms of policy and setting the framework for the uh, work of the administration. And so we have chosen three goals, which you can go back and watch all of those meetings that we've talked about those in more detail. And we will have some discussion about this because I already know Dr. Pierce has a question. Um, but they are strengthen reading proficiency, develop the portrait ready graduates, and close opportunity gaps. Those are the three goals. The guardrails, which set at our um, guardrails that kind of are uh, set, set the framework uh, the, 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 from the community values. So things that the district or the superintendent uh, won't do, they're kind of written in the, in the negative. Um, but we want to make sure that these are things that actually happen. And so they are to fund intervention support, align resources equitably. And if I make that bigger, there you go. Prioritize a whole child focus, ensure a culturally responsive staff. So these are the four guardrails that the board has asked. Now, in our discussions, and, and as I believe Dr. Pierce had mentioned, some interim schools and guardrails. Um, you, we did talk about those in the presentation and, and board members, you have those. That is not what we are actually voting on. We're not voting on that level. The lower level is super important, uh, but really that's the administration's work. And that is how they are going to accomplish the things that we have asked them to do. So just to be clear, we as a board are being asked to approve the high level vision of the portrait of a graduate and the district's goals which are those three goals um, here, uh, and the four guardrails, which appear here. So you have this document, you can take a look at it. You also know, like I said, those interim goals that feed into this, the higher goals, and we'll certainly be talking about those all of the time. Um, but that's, I just wanna make sure it's clear what we are voting on this evening. And you will know that notice that um, equity is, um, you know, it's in here, but it's really in all of the things that we're doing. We, we, we speak equity here, but in truth, as Dr. Pierce mentioned earlier, this idea that really all of everything that we're doing is really has a foundation in equity. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing and go ahead and let, maybe I'll stop sharing. Now, now I'm stuck, Stan. <laughs> uh, here we go, stop sharing. All right, so. Just so we're all on the same page about what we are doing. So I will ask uh, Vice President Reyes to read the resolution and then we will come back in with questions and comments. So the, the resolution to adopt Columbus City Schools portrait of graduate in the goals and guardrails for the district. Whereas the Columbus Board of Education, which is uh, in this document, the board, 
has worked with the Battelle for Kids to facilitate community conversations as to what skills a graduate from Columbus City Schools should have upon completion of their studies. And whereas the board has also engaged the Council of Great City Schools to help facilitate their own work around the board's goals and guardrails for the district. And whereas both projects have now culminated in a finished product, now therefore be it resolved that the board adopts the Columbus City Schools portrait of a graduate as contained in exhibit A, and the goals and guardrails for the Columbus City Schools as contained in Exhibit B. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. I think I heard Brown first, but yes. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Now, que questions? Uh, I already had a list going. So we have Dr. Pierce, Cole Beckerley, and then Ragley. Thank you so much, President Adair. Thank you to um, our community, our administration, and our board for working um, diligently on defining um, and conceptualizing our goals and guardrails. My question very briefly stated was um, in the lens, through the lenses of our seniors, have we examined the feasibility of increasing guardrail 3.1 higher than are 0.6%. And while we're not actually voting on the, the specifics, those interim um, goals and guardrails, have we considered the feasibility again of raising that higher than the 0.6? Yes. Um, Dr. Pierce and to the board, um, thank you for that question and that, um, that remark. One of the things that we stated um, during our special meeting is that there were some data points that I would have to bring back to the board as we refined. We wanted to make sure that the board agreed that these are the board goals and are the board guardrails. Um, and we agreed that to those to that these are the three goals and these are the four guardrails, but there are some data points that will need to be refined. Um, and there were some points that you wanted to see some increased percentages on. And so we are working with the team to bring those, um, those things back to you because I have to bring those back to the board for, uh, so that the board can um, approve and make sure that we're on target for what you want me to bring back to you. So yes, the answer to the short answer is yes, but I just wanted to, the board to know and the public to know that there is a process that when those are modified and we um, update our data sets that I uh, have to bring those back formally to the board so that you will see those adjustments that are being made. Thank you so much, Dr. Dixon. I appreciate that. Those were, that was the only question I had. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Uh, board member Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I think my question has been answered. Um, and just as a point of clarification, um, we are going back to looking at these additional metrics um, and making those changes that are a bit more bold and aggressive and reasonable, reasonable. They're smart goals, you know, so um, thank you for the clarification. Absolutely. And I know we specifically have some questions regarding um, um, goal one, strengthen our reading. And those were ones that uh, Board Member Cole and Board Member Beckerley um, uh, challenged us on and to make sure that we were, um, that we were, had bold goals. And we went back, I think Board, uh, board Member Beckerley met with some of the team members. Um, and we um, decided that once we um, got our spring data, that we would go back and look at that and make those adjustments then. And then once those adjustments are all made, I will bring those back formally to the board um, on where we landed with those metrics. The goals will stay the same. If there just be some tweaking in the percentages um, that we were looking to, the percentages of gain, percentages of proficiency, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay, so, all right, then we will move on to board member Beckerley. Unmute yourself. 
All right, so now I need to get some clarification. Uh, and, and first of all, I, and I apologize for this to my colleagues and to everyone that um, I have. Uh, I, my understanding was that um, the interim goals were also part of what was to be voted on this evening. So I guess my first question of clarification is, um, that is not anything that the board has responsibility or control over. They, these are the only goals, is that correct? That the interim goals are really the responsibility of the superintendent? The interim goals are the how the superintendent and the administration accomplish the goals we set. Now she can't just go out in a vacuum and make things up. Right. So she will come back to us and, and, and uh, you know, she'll present uh, recommendations and she'll ask feedback and things like that but we don't need to formally adopt it as this package. That will be something that it must remain flexible and fluid in truth because, uh, and she needs that ability to be able to adjust because data changes and we need to remain adaptable, right? That's one of our- uh, Absolutely. Yeah, so, so tonight we just are officially adopting that and we know we have more work to do um, on kind of tightening up those interim goals and we're waiting for data because we're still in the midst of COVID and we're still waiting for some things to shake out. Um, but we have a really good idea about how she's going to accomplish those. So we know that we're pretty okay in adopting these, these uh, broad set of goals because we see how she's going to, to get there even though we're still working on some of the data elements. Is that okay. better? And then, and then I, okay, so that brings me to my next question, which is, we're talking about tweaking things after we get more data in, but am I correct that this 55% um, proficiency for the third grade by June, 2026 is not up for tweaking or that still is up for tweaking? No, oh, that definitely can still be up for tweaking once we get the underlying data. If, if okay. we start to dig in and, and, they, and the team says, you know what, that's way too low or way too high, I don't know. We don't wanna set, um, our subs, we want to be, I think board members Paul said, you know, we definitely want to choose goals that are, that push us, but are realistic either way. Right. So, so right. Um, you know, once we start to look at the numbers, um, you know, that's something that we can come back to. It's not set in stone. We just need to come back as a board and decide and uh, readjust it. So it'd be another formal vote for us and there'd be a process to that. Um, but it definitely can be changed. It's not set in stone. Okay, even these goals and guardrails, because I, I kind of thought that they were, but all right. Um, no, I'm sorry, Carol, the goals and guardrails are accomplish those. I can't hear I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, Say so the, I'm sorry, the goals and guardrails are set. We decided okay. on those. It's how I'm going to measure those. How I'm going to get that information back to you that may have some adjustments. So yeah, how are you going to measure the interim? Exactly. Right. So this yes, 55. No, is let me say it no. again. Let me say it again. No, Thank no, you. No, no. So the strengthening reading proficiency will not change. This is a goal we have selected for at least the next five years. That's solid. Okay. Now we as a board have selected some measurements based on some, you know, conversations and, and information we have gotten. And that's what you're talking about, Carol. The 55% yes. by June of 2026. As of right now, based on the information that the team has got with our experts, with the iReady and all that, this is what has been suggested, that that still can be tweaked after we go back, that percentage itself. The goal of strengthening reading proficiency, looking at the percentage of the third grade, blah, 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 that stays the same. We're not changing that. Okay, yeah, okay. But okay. we can shift that 55% if we determine that another number is better. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, then, and, and I, I feel as though I want a little more time to think about it because one of the things that I'm struggling with, in my mind, 55% is reasonable when I consider, um, I hate using this term, but the loss is due to COVID. But when I think about it, the third graders at the, in June of 2026 won't even have started school until September of 2022. 
So that cohort that we're measuring ourselves on won't really have been affected by COVID. And I, should we have higher expectations for that cohort is my question. And so that, that's one of the misgivings I'm having about voting on this this evening is because I feel like I need to sort through that a little bit more. Um, I, what I do, and, and, and part of my misgivings are that um, uh, this also does not measure growth, this goal. And the interim goals and guard, the interim goals do, and that I'm very happy about. But I, I'm, I'm wrestling a little bit with um, knowing what we all know that growth is an important, as important as proficiency, if not more. And we all agree on that, I, the, that the board is adopting an, a goal that measures only proficiency has, is giving me concern. And I feel like we should have a thorough conversation about that before we do this. Um, the other thing, um, and I kind of have the same sort of, although I, I, that's really my biggest concern. And, and I would like to hear what my colleagues, you know, take on it is. Can I just reiterate then your concern? Your concern is very specific to the, the, the one goal. So you don't have a problem with the portrait. The final no, portrait. not at all. No. Although I wondered if we should have a, a time frame for that because we've talked about it in terms of time frame, and this resolution doesn't talk about that. But I'm 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 happy with the portrait and the competencies. Okay, and you are you are you, you are fine with the rest of the goals and guardrails. Your mm -hmm. your concern is, and you agree with strengthening reading as an overall as the goal. Absolutely. Okay. I'm just clarifying where you are standing. So, so you are, okay. You have, uh, were you finished for Member Beckerly? Well, yeah, and I guess I just, I feel like I, what I, the other thing I would like to say is that I would rather see us go, be more bold about our goal and ask the administration to help but have us back them up when they start allocating resources in order to achieve it. Because part of what we've all learned from our training with AJ is that, you know, the goal is only as good as our willingness to support the administration in trying to achieve it. So in it, I, I'm struggling with, you know, because it it, 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 it it turns around back on us. You know, I think there's this hesitancy to, to not be reasonable because it's not fair to not be reasonable in it. And I feel like if we were to say, you know, we want it to be 65% or 70% or whatever, and then it, it, the burden is on us to support the administration when they tell us this is what we need to do to hit that goal. And I, and I, and I feel like that's um, a piece of the conversation that we should really be having. I think some of you want to comment yeah. to her. So I saw Dr. Pierce first and then board member Raglan. I think, might I add, and, and Dr. Um, Dixon and members of your team, if you want to add on to this, because I'm going to try to walk or slow walk us through this. Um, so board member Beckerly, I think initially when we were having these conversations and we were looking at the goals for 2025, and I pulled out the MTSS, what has, which has them in the back, we were starting at this point of 43% where our students were being successful in this particular measure. And the change that our administration had seen was a seven percentage increase. So the prediction was based upon that. What I'm hearing administration say is, we would like some time to look at those spring spores to see if that 7% increase is still gonna hold for us moving forward. Now, even with taking that into account, I know personally, I brought the question to the floor and said, hey, when we get down to 2025, based upon everything that's going on with COVID-19, do you still anticipate that we'll hit that 70% that was you know, stated in our MTS and in, in our administrative goals, right? And so again, I appreciate the administration for looking at that and tweaking that number a little bit, but I think what we have to really gain clarity on is 
is there a particular timeline at which we can anticipate the administration coming back to say, yeah, that 7% held, we're going to go with this, with this goal, or look, that 7% did not hold, we're going to change and tweak it even more. Uh, can I? So I guess on? that's how I'm understanding it. Let hold on. I think was that a question to Dr. Dixon, Dr. Pierce? If she wanted to weigh in, I was just um, you know responding to Board Member Beckerly and through my way of understanding it. So if Dr. Dixon would like to weigh in, yeah. yes, you're right, Dr. Pierce. Um, and I think one of the things we were saying was some of the data points, and I think um, and AJ. Um, helped us um, um, articulate that with some of the data points we didn't have um, at the time. You know, we, we know this, we know these are the goals that the board, that the board wants. Um, and we just wanted to make sure that we have the right baseline data to set these goals moving forward. And so we wanted to be able to come back and bring to you you know, this is what we initially thought, but now that we have some additional data points in, this is not where we are. We need to move this this goal, this um, move this data point up. And and, but, and, and, and that timeline for us, um, majority of that was in the spring, Dr. Pierce. You know, we were have most of these data points back um, in the spring um, for um, to to start in the fall. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Board Member Raglan wanted to also address your uh, initial comment. Um, I, I think my question is really for Dr. Dixon. Are you confident that uh, you can come up with some answers that will help solve uh, Board Member Beckerley's unreadiness uh, on the goals and guardrails? Well, I don't, I don't want to speak for Board Member Berkeley, but I just, you know, my thought was that she had some concerns about the, uh, the percentages with um, strengthening reading uh, proficiency. And she wanted to make sure that we were measuring growth, just not proficiency. And she worked with some team members yesterday to make some adjustments and has some wonderful adjustments um, that uh, we reviewed um, yesterday. I didn't bring those adjustments back to the board, um, but we made those adjustments yesterday. Um, and we looked at that and I thought there were um, some thoughtful adjustments. Um, also, when board member Cole um, suggested that he wanted to see some bolder <laughs> goals, wanted to see that data, um, and we knew that we needed to, make, to meet with some other people, actually we were, um, suggesting we having a meeting with someone um, um, later this week to talk about what that should look like. Because we want to be able to be bold, but we also want to be able to meet the goals too, or be close to it. And as um, Board Member Beckler said, and as our team has done, make sure we have the staff to align with the strategy. So we know that when we move forward with our priorities, we're going to have district priorities that align with these goals and guardrails so that the entire district is focused on strengthening reading proficiency, for strengthening reading for all of our students, pre-K through 12, and make sure we have our staffing, our programs, et cetera. All of those pieces are aligned, but there are some data sets that we need to review in the spring before we set those uh, percentages in stone. And wanted the flexibility to come back to the board um, with those particular data sets, just like some of the other goals. Remember some of the other goals we stated, uh, particularly some of the guardrails that we needed to bring some additional data back. Um, and some of the, even with the portrait work, we needed to come back because we're working with Columbus State to develop some of that. So it was fluid that wanted the flexibility to be able to bring information back to the board formally so that the board can know where those new data points are and that I'm not working in isolation and um, <laughs> without the board support, because this is what the board is, will be evaluating me on. And, and yes. if, if you could speak uh, 
a little bit, Dr. Dixon, about what your next steps in the rollout of this are. Um, that would be helpful. So the next step that the uh, board adopts, the formally adopts the, the portrait, which is, which is our long-term vision. And we wanted to be very specific with that. The board adopts a long-term vision of the portrait of a graduate. These are the hopes and dreams and aspirations that we have for our students. That's our North Star. And then the board goals and guardrails. What are the things that the board wants to make sure the district is focused on that I am responsible for? And what are the, those are the three goals? And what are the things that the board wants me to protect? You know, they, and those are our guardrails. Then we're going to align, we're aligning those with our strategic priorities. And so that's what come next. And then we will have an entire packet, including the district's priorities, the portrait, the board goals and guardrails. This is gonna be the work of the district for the next three, five years and, and moving forward. Yes, so that so was our next step. Yes, ma'am. And so my question then is to board member Beckerly, what is your suggestion for uh, what you'd like to see tonight? I believe you're muted. muted. I believe you're muted. Sorry. Um, I do. I will answer that in a second, James, but I do want to circle back because I did have an incredibly productive discussion with um, Dr. Klein and Dr. Breeden. Um, and um, in truth, when I thought we were voting on the whole package, um, I was less concerned about this 55% because I was convinced that the interim goals as we had structured them, as we discussed them, um, were gonna have us blow the 55% out of the water because for the first time we were really focusing on, um, or we, 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 it was, and it was, just, it was a cultural change really because we were focusing not just on proficiency, we're focusing on growth and measuring growth. And to me, that's, going to change the whole dynamic of how we approach our instruction and how we prioritize what we're doing in the classroom. And I thought that was really fabulous. So I, I'm, I'm just really trying to wrap my mind around the fact that what we're voting on today is just as 55%, because in and of itself, you know, I'd like to see us do better. And I'd like to see us do better because um, in the end, it's on the board. What are our aspirations for our district? And then it, 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 it's incumbent upon us to support the administration in getting it done. And, and so I'm struggling a bit with, you know, voting on a 55% proficiency rate in June, 2026. I, you know, oh. what, what it should be, I don't know, James. So I board just, member- And I feel like a little bit like, can we just spend a little more time thinking about it? So board member Beckerley, to, to, as a point of clarification, yeah, we're not voting on the 55% of anything. What we're voting on this evening is the structure. Is the structure okay. is our broad set of goals and our guardrails or priorities. Really, guardrails are our guiding principles. Okay. So, what we're communicating to Dr. Koga and everybody else in the community is that we are, we are approving tonight, should we do that, our goals and our guiding priorities, our guiding principles to our work. That's what we're voting on. We're not voting on the other smaller elements that are the how to get there. We're not voting on that yet. No, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But I, I would like to add, because we have quantified these elements, we are voting on the quantification of these elements, right? So even with the closing opportunity gap, we're looking at that and we're moving um, to, we're increasing, the goal is to increase from the 81.4% to the 86. So that's, you know, that's an increase um, by what, five, five percentage points. Um, our portrait ready graduates were, 
planning to see an increase of 25%. So we're quantifying these goals, which in terms makes them smart goals, measurable. So I can see where board member Beckerly is having, you know, this, this moment where she says, let's really think about this. I think the question for our board needs to be, are we comfortable with the superintendent's timeline of saying, we are going to continue to monitor what we anticipate seeing in terms of these changes again, the expected rate at which we think we will we'll be able to increase these scores reasonably until the spring. What is our flexibility in terms of not quantifying strengthening reading prof proficiency at this particular point? My, my, from my standpoint, um, I am fine with that. That is an expectation of mine. We are constantly to be monitoring what our performance is and how close or how far away we are in understanding in depth the why of that. All of us are responsible for that. But functionally, operatively speaking, the superintendent and administration are responsible for very clearly articulating to us the how and why. And yes, there's an, a definite expectation that we not only meet our quantifiables, but that we're monitoring them regularly as they have shown us this evening that they've done. The, the other- Hold on, hold on. Oh, I'm, gonna sorry. Let, I'm gonna let uh, board member Brown, because he's actually in the queue, jump in <laughs> in this conversation. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, I, I didn't think uh, that you'd forgotten about me, Jen. <laughs> um, a couple of comments that I wanted to make. Um, and I appreciate um, those of you who are pushing us to um, really challenge ourselves and to try to push the goals up um, just as uh, uh, Vladimir and, and, uh, and others have talked about. I think that's important and important for us all to be on the same page that that's what we want to do and allow the administration to, to do that. Um, you know, I, as they have better numbers, as they make adjustments, and to always try to keep moving in that direction. Uh, but I also understand uh, the importance of getting this structure and plan in place and doing so quickly. Um, not so quickly that we're forgetting things. I think we've given this a lot of thought. We've given this a lot of study. And the overall principles that we've laid out on paper um, are things that we have all agreed on. It's the metrics on some of it that we uh, would, you know, we're wondering, uh, can we can we get higher? Um, so I'm comfortable going forward with this tonight, um, as long as we do have the understanding that uh, we're going to try to push these numbers up challenge us, our, ourselves more as we go forward. Um, but we don't want to set uh, any of these goals or metrics so high that we're going to fail at the end of it. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, we want to be able to have something achievable and uh, have some wins uh, as we go. But uh, you know, I think having that understanding uh, with our superintendent in particular, um, you know, allows me to be comfortable going forward now with loading on these. Thank you, Board Member. And I just, I mean, I don't know why this is striking me, but this has not been a short process. If you remember, this whole thing started <laughs> pre-COVID with portrait, and then we did a lot of work over the summer um, so, you know, we, we've been thinking about these goals and guardrails for a long time. Yeah, I, I misspoke as to, as to that particular piece, but yes, we have been working at this a long time and uh, we've done some really good work. Okay. I guess, Ms. Beckerly, do you feel, or Barbie Mary Beckerly, do you feel that um, the whole concept of this is in stone is what's bothering you? I hope that what um, Brown and Mr. Cole and Dr. Pierce and everyone said is that 
we, we are still trying to establish what our baseline numbers are, right? That's what Dr. Dixon just shared. Once that is brought back to the board, when we get our spring numbers, we hope that they're higher. They might be lower, but as any goal and guardrail, I'm sorry, Dr. Dixon, can you mute? Can you mute? I'm a muter. Um, then what is gonna be our responsibility is when she comes back in spring um, or with, with the numbers, we may have to make an adjustment up or down. But I think what we need to understand as a board, what if next year she has all the supports in place and we blow it out of the water and we're hitting 70? Guess what? We're gonna to have to make another adjustment and we're gonna to have to make it a stretch goal to your point. That is, that's what, so this is not set it and forget it. It's not the commercial. This is, this is we're, we're working towards it. We adjust it, we make it better. We stretch it just like anywhere, you know, all of us have worked where they say, here's your goal. And when you achieve it, they say, guess what? Here's more work, right? We're gonna move, we're gonna move the goalpost. And that's on purpose because our target is to help our students be the best they can be and hit the highest goals possible. So as everybody has said, and I'm going to reiterate, just, you know, the concept is there. The numbers may change. That, that comes back. They may change tomorrow. They may change next year. And what we need to do is have that adaptability to ensure that we're hitting it. Now, if they go low, I think then we have a different conversation. We probably don't want to lower the, the, the goalpost. But um, if they go high, you're always going to be adjusting. You're going to be making sure that we have those stretch goals. To, but to your point, um, uh, Board Member Beckerly, is we, we can't just throw a bunch of money and support to something and hope that we hit a 20 point difference. Uh, we gotta make sure that it is a stretch goal, but not uh, something that we're never gonna achieve. So that's my two cents. Okay, so I think that we, well, I mean, we're not going to keep talking about it all night. So unless it fails, then we'll have to pick it back up. So I'm going to go ahead and call the vote. Call the question. Go ahead and call the roll. My apologies. All right. Ms. Beckerly? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Cole? Yes. Dr. Pierce? Yes. Mr. Ragland? Yes. Vice President Reyes? Yes. President Adair? Yes. That motion carried. Thank you. We still have a lot of work to do on these. Okay, this is just the first step, first step. All right, congratulations, everyone. Hey, you know what, staff, you all worked so hard on these. You did wonderful presentations. Board members, you worked really hard on these. You're out in the public. You know, this was a lot of, of work. So this is, this is, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about the next step. So congratulations to everyone on that. This is a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal for our district. Okay, let's move on to item 8.2. Uh, we have the first reading of the proposed amendment to the Charter of the Policy Review Committee. I'm going to turn it over to Board Member Brown. Thank you, uh, Jen. Uh, the, I, I, I believe, um, I know that several of the committees, uh, now that we've had some restructuring, um, are working through this charter process. And uh, thanks to uh, several of you. I, we have templates to work from that has made this job a little bit easier. Uh, but as um, and there was no surprise uh, that my committee, uh, the, the uh, policy review committee, um, really went over this pretty thoroughly and has made some adjustments to what was there. Um, what I would urge everybody to do, if you've not already done so, is to actually read through it. And um, I don't think you need to read through the markup version. 
I think it makes sense for you to look only at the completed version um, with all that markup uh, because most of that is, is irrelevant. Um, it was a different committee for a different purpose at that time. But uh, the, the key things that I would point out to you is that we are renaming the committee to conform to uh, our new challenge uh, and our new purpose. So uh, the committee would be called the Governance Policy and Advocacy Committee. Um, I don't know if we have an acronym for that yet. Um, I'd like to point out uh, one change that, at least to me, um, is significant um, because it's something that I've always worked on for you know 20 years, 30 years, or, or more, and that is um, there's a place in here where it talks about citizen participation was was put out put out for discussion, and we are recommending changing that to participation. And even more important, we don't like the word citizens in this context, and we want to use the word residents. Um, it's more inclusive. We have an awful lot of students and people living in our community that are part of our school community who are not necessarily citizens. And yet we uh, want to operate uh, providing them full participation and uh, They've got the same rights to education and quality education as anyone else. Uh, that may be something that the board wants to consider in other places in policy. And then finally, um, although it was tempting for me to uh, consider doing so, I, I decided not to put anything buried in here that would give me unilateral power to make changes in the school district that uh, uh, some of you may not like. Uh, so I, I refrain from that. Uh, I am presenting this for first reading, and uh, I would ask, uh, uh, perhaps more strongly than in the past, that you do take a look at it, that you do read it, and uh, please get back to me if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you catch something that we've missed, um, any of those are, are possible. And uh, I'll look forward to that. And then uh, probably at the next meeting, we'll be able to adopt this. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member uh, Brown. Uh, Board Member Cole, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, very quickly. I want to congratulate the committee on their work um, in designing this initial legislation. Um, I think it is incredibly inclusive. I think um, in addition to that, it gives very sound perspective as to uh, what our respective roles are as board members and as committee members uh, in that legislation. So uh, I encourage each one of our colleagues to read it. Um, it's actually uh, very well put together. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for your uh, work on that uh, committee and um, you know, it is the goal that all committees will be getting their charters to us uh, before the end of summer or before we go on break so that we can have a great start for the beginning of the school year. That's kind of when we're going to kick everything off under this uh, new restructure. So that's just a friendly reminder to the committees that uh, I need to see, we need to get your charters on the next agenda and it's coming up. So thank you for that. And please do read it. It's so important. Uh, we are realigning our work. All of your thoughts, even if you don't sit on that committee, uh, are really critical. Uh, so please, please provide your suggestions. Uh, we've worked so hard on our goals and guardrails and portrait. And really, that's how we do our work is through our committees. Um, so please take a look at it. OK. All right, so that will uh, constitute the first meet, uh, reading of the proposed amendments uh, to the Charter of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you so much, Board Member Brown and committee members. All right, our next item is our consent agenda. This evening, our consent agenda consists of items 10.1 to 23.7.
Are there any items that a board member would like to remove from the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent I'll move agenda? move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, moved by Brown, second by Cole. Uh, any items you wish to discuss? Seeing none, please call the roll. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Cole. Yes. Dr. Pierce. Yes. Mr. Ragland. Yes. Vice President Reyes. Yes. President Adair. Yes, with the exception of 19.1. And you vote how on 19.1? I'm sorry, abstain. <laughs> abstain from 19.1. It's my mom's contract. I cannot vote on it. <laughs> Just making sure. Uh, Ms. Beckerly. Yes. That motion carries, even 19.1. Good, my mom will be happy. <laughs> so all the other teachers that were in there <laughs> and staff. All right, thank you all so much. So our consent agenda has passed. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move over to board announcements. Um, board members, let me know if you have any announcements e this evening. I would like to um, ask board members, um, this is just on the fly, I didn't even tell you this, board members Raglan and Cole, I believe both of you participated in our FMP process yesterday. So I'd love to hear a little update on how that went. And uh, um, for those uh, board members that are coming up, um, giving you a little chance too to promo what's going on in your regions. Um, just to remind everyone, the FMP process just kind of picks up where the portrait and this and all that we just did kind of leaves off. It's really about the visioning of our buildings and our spaces uh, for the future and how do we really accomplish these things uh, to make sure that we are we have those spaces that uh, that will accomplish these things so we want people to think big and bold and really uh really push themselves to create uh spaces and and educational um opportunities for all across the district okay so i'm going to ask board member raglan and cole to chat about what happened last night Thank you, Madam President. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about the Region 2 Facilities Master Plan Community Engagement Meeting. We had a wonderful time uh, meeting with our community leaders and partners in Region 2. I want to give a special shout out to the two co-chairs uh, of the Region 2. Uh, both Charity Martin King and Jalonza Moore uh, did an excellent job of facilitating uh, not just our general discussion, but also um, also our breakout sessions. Uh, the Liggett team did a, an excellent job of getting us prepared and really kind of level setting everything that we are doing. Um, it felt really good understanding everything that we're doing right now. Uh, one of the first words that Dr. Dixon used with us when she first got on board was alignment and making sure that we're aligned in everything that we're doing. And it felt like um, for the, the first time in a very long time, that this district was really kind of rowing in the same direction on multiple fronts. And we got a glimpse of that last night. Uh, we had two special guests. Uh, one was uh, Coach Clarence Daniels, the new head football coach at, at Columbus Walnut Ridge, who joined us and talked about um, the facilities that, at his current school at Afrocentric, as well as the needs for the facilities at one of our older schools in Region 2 at Walnut Ridge. And then we also had Ernest Doc West, who is the principal at Columbus Sciota, who talked with us about um, how special of a school Sciota is and, uh, and really gave us some good perspective on, um, he had just left Independence and moved from Independence to Sciota. And so both of them were on board with us with plenty of members from the community. We're looking forward to everything else that we're about to do uh, in advocating for Region 2 and the needs of our students there. I was just impressed with our community and the way that they engaged in our breakout sessions. And I'm just thankful that we're uh, all on the same page with this facilities master plan process. So, uh, so thank you, Dr. Dixon and our other direct reports. Thank you, Madam President, uh, for really showing some leadership and breaking this down so that we're getting a discussion on our facilities based on our regions. I think that's really gonna allow for more participation. Uh, and, and I think it's going to give us some real, uh, real good marching orders moving forward. So I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you for allowing me to address that this evening, ma'am. Thank you for doing so. Board Member Cole, what was going on in your region? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, 
In Region 5, I participated in yesterday's FMP discussion um, and shout out to Tiffany White, as well as Dr. Uh, Demadi Cortez. Uh, she did an awesome job, uh, Medina Cortez. Uh, she did an awesome job, uh, both of them as well, leading this piece. Um, the conversation was very rich and, and honest in terms of feedback around our facilities, where there are challenges, where we're doing things well. Um, our collective uh, bargain staff also answered those, you know, they, they participated in the, the conversation very well also. So thank you and thank them. Excellent. Uh, board members, who's up next? Uh, you want to promo? Like, who's, who's the next set of members? I don't remember. Zachary and Pierce. Zachary and Pierce is up. They're up. Do you want to talk a little bit about your regions and, and promo what's going to happen? Um, well, at Region 3, we're very much looking forward to um, our first session. Uh, we're grateful to all the work that everyone's done to get us set up for this. I know, Misty, you've been very involved. Um, and uh, shout out ahead of time to our two co-chairs, whom I know will be great, um, Julia Lynn Walker and Mike Alcock. Looking forward to it. And again, kudos uh, to our president and the team that um, set this up to be done this way. I hope it's a model for a lot of, um, for our approach to other things that we have to attack on a district level, because I think it's very exciting. And I, and I can, you know, and I think that um, the community is starting to think of themselves in terms of regions too, which is really appropriate and, and exciting. Thank you. Dr. Pierce, did you want to add anything? Region 4. Um, so I will preview Region 4, but also make my announcement. Um, and, and community, bear with me for a second, because um, today is a day that um, we received a, a verdict and in many respects, social justice that a lot of our students are, are studying and analyzing in their classroom. And as we received that verdict, I felt in my heart an overwhelming uh, emotion of happiness for the acknowledgement of humanity, for not only George Floyd, um, but for Black people as a community. While I felt that overwhelming emotion, I was also reminded as I saw violence in our community this evening, that our schools are hubs, not just for learning, but for building relationship. They are spaces where our students can come to learn and gain an awareness of diversity, where they can come and learn who they are as individuals where our staff and teachers have the opportunity to feed into them, to wrap their arms around them. And so as I encourage Region 4 to participate in tomorrow's community conversation that will take place from 7.30 to 9 p.m., I want to echo that this process is critically important for our community. Uh, Maya Angelou said that every child belongs to all of us and they will bring us tomorrow in direct relation to the responsibility we have shown to them. The FMP process is our responsibility to create spaces in which our students can thrive, spaces in which our students can learn, and what we've experienced in this year, what we've experienced as the vanguard, which includes our young people fight to advance social justice around civil rights, around civil liberties, around housing affordability and food insecurity, is that education plays a key and fundamental role in the future that we create. Don't miss this opportunity to feed into the lives of our young people, which seems like just a conversation is somebody's future. And it's our responsibility as adults 
to participate in that conversation, to stand up and vote for our students when they can't vote, to create the spaces and put our money where our mouth is so they can succeed and be successful. And so as we think about what today has brought us, both the good and the bad, as we think about the work that we need to do in our larger society, but also within our district, I wanna leave you with a quote from Marion Wright Elderman. Every child's life is sacred and it is long past time that we protect it. Please ma'am, please sir, participate in our FMP process and build and create a better future for all of our students. Thank you, Dr. Pierce, such, such strong words. It is so critical and that's exactly why we are out in the community and um, it is so important that everyone participates. Um, and there's gonna be a lot more opportunities. So this, this is just the first round of meetings and they will be, there will be many more community meetings for you to participate. Um, let me give uh, Vice President Reyes and uh, Board Member Brown before I go back around for just regular announcements to talk about what's going on in their regions for FMP. So we have region one and region six. Yes, so um, region one is west side, the best side. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so please join us. This is um, the West Side Region One will be on Thursday at 5.30. Helping uh, us out is uh, the talented uh, Mrs. Lee Cole and Margarita Revilla from our, our West Side community, student led by Sanai Hanks. So please, please do tune in. You're on the West Side. Please also note there are um, a lot of a lot of information is being sent out there asking for some survey uh, feedback. So if you haven't had a chance, please um, visit our website. There is the FMP website. There's also the survey links. And yes, there is a Spanish version to the video uh, uh, welcoming people onto our FMP process. So uh, again, we ask you to please. Um, Come and join us at uh, Region 1 on Thursday night at 5.30. Thank you. What about Region 6, Board Member Brown? Well, Region 6, we are getting ready, and I'm excited forward to this. Um, we have a, a great region here in uh, the central part of Columbus, um, and we have uh, the benefit of having some uh, outstanding schools included in our, uh, in our uh, region, uh, including uh, Kaz, and we heard from some of their students earlier, uh, Fort Hayes, and on and on. Um, so I think we're going to have uh, a good turnout, um, and I think that it's going to be a lot of fun and that we're going to make some progress. And uh, uh, I think I'll learn more uh, Thursday evening at 7 to nine when we uh, when we do this meeting. Excellent. Thank you so much, board members, for really adopting a region and listening because we promised the community that we would continue to listen to them. And that is what we're doing as we work through the FMP process. So I appreciate all of you for doing that. So now let me go back around for general um, announcements. And I know board member Ragland, board member Brown, Vice President Reyes, I think had another in the, no. And board member Beckerly, did you have an announcement? No, okay. Raglan Brown. Thank you, Madam President. I, I just want to express my sincere condolences to the family of Shay Ford Anthony, uh, her husband, Bill, and her two sons. Uh, Ms. Ford Anthony was a 1994 graduate of Mifflin High School, um, a, a very, very strong advocate here in the community. Uh, in, in work for uh, Auditor Stinziano as the Deputy uh, Chief of Staff, uh, passed away in a very tragic accident over the weekend. And I just want to express my condolences to the entire family, uh, every single alum of Mifflin High School, and all of you punchers, our hearts are, are hurting right now. Um, and, and I just wanted to express my condolences from this setting uh, to that family. And, and please know that if there are any types of needs, um, please, please feel free to lean on us. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Madam President. Member Brown. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I too was going to mention uh, Shay and, uh, and and the loss in that family and express condolences. But in addition to that one, uh, we've had a, a very long time judge serve in this community that has just passed away, and that was uh, Judge uh, Feist. Uh, he's retired from the bench for some time, uh, but he uh, he has a, a long history, and his family has a long history in this community, and uh, and he's done just a, a really good job as a judge and as a mentor to many many lawyers, and uh, I think it's appropriate to uh, to mention him. Uh, Beyond that, I wanted just to, and I, this is something I, I would rarely do because I think of these holidays as kind of made up holidays, but tomorrow is Administrative Professionals Day. Um, it used to be called Secretary's Day. I know that I grew up knowing it only as Secretary's Day, and I grew up uh, with a school secretary always being the person who ran the building always being the person who uh, knew the most and and was really in charge of everything uh, in in uh, our elementary school and my junior high school. So I, I just want to give a shout out to uh, all of our administrative professionals um, throughout the district. Uh, they rarely get opportunities to appear in front of us or get any public recognition for their work, but they are invaluable. Uh, they do a wonderful job in supporting and uh, all of us and all of the uh, administrative staff, uh, the central office folks and building staff, building administrators, um, and and helping to make us all look good. Um, and and you know I think that's that's important. So uh, I just want to, perhaps for the first time with one of these holidays, uh, use it for the purpose it's intended and uh, thank uh, all of our administrative professionals. I know they are all uh, members of, of OPSI and uh, I know they have great leadership in that organization and uh, we just don't think of them often enough. So that's it. Thank you, and yes, a big shout out to all of our administrative professionals. Um, Dr. Dixon is going to send you all flowers, right? <laughs> hearts, hearts of love. <laughs> okay, all right. I just wanted to um, make sure everyone knew that our partners at City Council, they're having a Teens and COVID-19 virtual town hall tomorrow with Council Member Favor and Council Member Brown. It's from 4 to 5.30. It is called Teens and COVID-19, Let's Get Real, a town hall discussion to learn how teens are dealing with challenges of COVID-19 and how Columbus can support their success. You can tune in on the Facebook page for City Council um, or their YouTube channel. So it is from, it starts at 4 o'clock from 4 to 5.30. Any other announcements? What? Uh, Vice President yes. Reyes. I just want to uh, thank, I know I can for the, I know I mentioned it a couple of times for the opportunity to go out into uh, the community and meet with our uh, seniors, providing them uh, with some signs. Uh, I want to also thank the uh, community members who have stepped up. I think they had 124 volunteers to go out and deliver over 2000 signs to our seniors, some of our volunteers even went and got some extra goodie bags. So some of our um, students got a little bit extra from all the other things that are being sent out to, to them. Uh, really appreciating um, the candor and the conversation uh, with our students talking about how this year uh, is going. And, and some were very optimistic and very happy about how the year is going. And they were very surprised by it. And, and others are just very excited to graduate. So I want to thank our partners. I know I can, and um, obviously the district and all the other partners who are involved with the um, how we're honoring our seniors uh, during this time. 
um, that's really um, a big one. Thank you. Thank you. And one more from Dr. Pierce. Um, so this last one kind of connects with the with the first one. Um, as our community thinks about um, actions and, and how we move forward after today, a number of community members may want to continue conversations about how we create and maintain safe schools and safe neighborhoods. Again, our FMP conversations are a great way for you to be able to connect and keep that conversation going, but also move that conversation from just conversation to action. Let me say that a, a very different way. To our young people who may decide that um, protest and, and action in the street is a viable solution um, after today and, and moving forward in, into the next weeks and dealing with creating safe schools and neighborhoods and communities. That is a viable solution. But here at our Columbus City Schools, we also have the solution in which we welcome you to sit at the table and help us create policies and practices and actions that make our schools, neighborhoods, and communities safe spaces. So to all, you are welcome to join the conversation. We look forward to having you in the FMP conversation. And even if you can't make the conversation, reach out to a board member. We're all available via email. Some of us even have our cell phones um, and contact numbers on uh, our website. Please reach out to us and just start the conversation. Um, I promise that, that all of us don't bite <laughs> None of us invite. Um, and we welcome the opportunity to engage with the community in positive and productive ways. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go ahead and now move into item 25, which is executive session. Uh, Vice President Reyes for the motion. Thank you. I move that the Board of Education recess into executive session for section 121.22 G3 of the Ohio Revised Code to confer with an attorney for the public body concerning disputes involving the public body that are the subject of pending or imminent court action. I'll second, provided we have a short break. Okay, please call the roll. Mr. Cole? Yes. Dr. Pierce? Yes. Mr. Ragland? Yes. Vice President Reyes? Yes. President Adair? Yes. Ms. Beckerling? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you. And so for staff who are not coming with us into executive session, uh, thank you so much for participating tonight. Great reports um, and for all your hard work on the goals and guardrails. We appreciate you. Happy Administrative Assistance Day tomorrow and have a wonderful evening. And Columbus community, we will be back to adjourn the meeting in public session. Board members, please head to executive session uh, where we will have a tiny, teeny break and then get started.